All right, um, M, where are you? Weird. I don't see M. Anybody ah! there? <laughs> Surprise! I am here, and so is Eva. And uh, Eva's it, hanging out with uh, Krampus and Geo. In the corner. If you are on audio, you don't know what the fuck we're talking about, but uh, M just leaned into the Zoom frame. I just leaned... I- and I'm breaking everything. Listen, it was complicated to try and figure out how to squeeze Em into my little recording corner. So that's my bad. Okay, so up until, by the way, I look so much taller than you. I know, it's because I'm in my fainting couch. Yeah, right. right you can right, finally right. see me in the fainting couch. So for anyone who is like me, which is probably a hot zero people, but I <laughs> thought that there was a massive table here this whole time with like a monitor you were working with. I oh, had no, no idea. It was just empty it's space. It's a literal music stand from Amazon that I put my laptop on. Had no clue. So yeah. anyway, uh, there... I was thinking, like, how are we going to rearrange her whole office so we can record oh, together? Oh, you just a lounge. You just anyway, a lounge. Um, yes, Eva and I, so I was recently in Denver for a wedding with Allison's family, and then Eva had the wonderful idea before I left of, like, what if, while you're in Denver, I also go to Denver and see some of my friends from there, and then we fly together to Cincinnati and surprise Christine and have a little spooky baby shower. Key- keyword surprise. I literally went home to my house, and I was, and Blaze was like, can you let Gio in upstairs? Like, he's on the balcony. And I saw, I was like, why is this door closed to my like upstairs TV room? And I open it up. Mother, I screamed. I think I screamed so loud. You did. I, I, I was just, scared. I just, <laughs> I disturbed every ghost in my home. All the Victorian ghosts have woken up. I screamed so loud. I actually am amazed my water didn't break. We, so Eva and I, our goal was to make the water break. It didn't work. We wanted to be part of history. You didn't try hard enough. But, um, but no, it's, and also shout out to Blaze and Zandy because we've been in a group chat with them for a while now trying to plan this. <laughs> I am really impressed that like, I didn't even have an ink, like not even like something's off. Nothing. Not even a clue. I Well, I got really paranoid once we hit like 20 minutes before you were going to get home. And I was like, oh, well, she for sure knows. Because uh, as we all know, Christine is um, has a few loose screws. <laughs> and she definitely, for no reason, will check, like, find my friends or I'm her Nest cameras. I'm occasionally, like, weirdly paranoid for no reason. And it, like, foils people's And anytime plans. we've ever tried to surprise her before, if we're oddly quiet on text that day, she'll be like, I thought something was up because we didn't talk all day. I, I, this one, you really got me. We did decoy texts and everything. No, you Good did job, decoy texts. Uh, you, Blaze, logged me out of the ring doorbell because I would have been like, oh, did I get any packages today? And I would have been like... Well, M's big, big dumb face is in my doorbell. There. What is going on? So logged me out of the doorbell. Like fully, fully all the stops were pulled. The problem was all, I almost created, not surprisingly. Oh. Almost. Wow, Christine almost really <laughs> completely wrecked the whole fucking plan. So let me start from my perspective oh, first. It's probably better from your perspective because I was going la di da through my so life. Eva's literally at the airport about to get on her flight to Denver and to so meet we, you to right? meet me, and then we're gonna fly the next day to Cincinnati. Oh, for God's sake! And uh, Blaze texts the group chat and he's like, "So slight problem. Um, Christine <laughs> might be getting induced tonight because we're going to the hospital, and the baby might be here before you get here." <laughs> And Eva, See you text, soon. and Eva texts me and she's like, um, what do no, we do? No, no, no. She said, oh, eek. eek. What did we do? What do we do? And I was like, I guess this is like perfect timing, like that the baby would be here as we're also arriving. Yeah. Honestly. Every, the whole family's going to be together. If I found out later that you guys canceled a trip, I would have, I would have had a mental breakdown. So I'm really glad that you would have at least still shown up. That I don't know what good. we would have done the whole time. We would have just had a, a time together in Ohio and Kentucky, I guess. You would have been, been babysitting busy. or something. I don't know what you would have been doing. Luckily, that did not happen. But what? So what was the story there? Oh, right. Basically, I was uh, I was doing my fun little paranoid thing one night, like, as I do. And I was like, Blaze, can you check my blood pressure? And he was like, why? And I was like, I don't know, just for fun, which is like, this is what I do for fun. It's the most Christine fun I've ever I know, I know, I know, I know. And Blaze obviously has a blood pressure cuff from the hospital. So he's like, sure. And then he checks it about four times. And his face is kind of screwing up a little bit. And I'm like, what? And he's like, it's really high. And I was like, that's strange because I usually have really, really low blood pressure. So I was like, well, okay. It's like, (laughs) it was like two in the morning. So I was like, let's go to bed. We'll check it in the morning. Next morning, it's even higher. And he's like, we need to call the doctor. So of course I go into the midwife and she's like, 
yeah, it's it's really high. This is not normal and blah, blah. I have a headache. So, you know, if you know anything about preeclampsia, it's very dangerous. So they don't mess around with blood pressure. So they're like, well, and so she was like, you should just go home and keep an eye on it. And then I heard my doctor in the hallway go like, no, she has to go to the hospital. And oh, I was shit. like, ah. So they ship me to the hospital and I'm like, I might have a baby today. And they're like, we'll <laughs> induce you if it doesn't go down. Um, and lo and behold, I get to the hospital, check in, and they're like, oh, it seems pretty normal to me. And I'm like, this hospital bill is going to piss me off in a few weeks when it as, shows up at my door. As Blaze t- was texting us updates of like, oh, no, like, we're back home. Everything's fine. Then you text him and you're like, I've had a day. Em. And I was like, <laughs> you've had a day. Like, I was wondering what the hell we were going to do on our plane. And I was I was like, no way. I know. I'm I was like, why did you tell me? <laughs> also, please look at Eva and the cat right now. Okay. My cat is like, I remember how I announced that my cat was being really weird around me. Turns out it's not just me because Juniper is climbing on Eva's lap and he again he is not I'm just convinced that it must be like his LA memories because Em and Eva showed up and he's suddenly like up in everyone's business and he is not a cuddly cat. Speaking of uh old LA memories Gio I think I gave abandonment issues to because yeah. he really avoided me for the first day yeah he was like he not was sure not what it. to do with himself he was like really unsettled about the whole thing i was like because I, I knew we were surprising christine and christine would be mad if she missed geo and i reuniting I w- so i told blaze like can you film this so christine can see it later and geo was like much more excited about eva and i feel like geo <laughs> was like yeah i fucking know He's a you Scorpio. where he have has, you been we know what his what i should have known it all along that scorpio blood was right and where there his the head whole is time. yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the update here. I actually, we're literally recording this, uh, before my next appointment. So we'll see if my blood pressure is high again. Cause they actually, I didn't tell you this, but last week they said, um, oh yeah, we're looking at your chart and your blood pressure like spiked last week and now it's higher. And they're like, so if it's higher next week, then like we've got a problem. So we're going to get that checked today. Eva and I are so desperately hoping that your water breaks while we're here. Uh, me too. Or you're induced I think that would here. be so fun. I mean, it wouldn't be so, fun. I mean, That's you won't for, have fun. For you. <laughs> Even I'll have a blast. We'll be at CVS eating candy or something. Well, I don't <laughs> em, I like that that's my definition of fun. <laughs> Blaze actually offered M to get the plus one position. Uh, plus one to the, very kind. to the doctor. So we'll very see. Kind. I was like, I don't know about that cervical check. And I was like, I know all about cervical checks from TikTok. And I'm like, I have been learning way too much on? about um, your cervix. You know cervix. more than I do I, about my cervix. <laughs> I've Lord. seen it at 10 cents meters and i'm like hmm, well, i certainly have not don't uh, look until i don't after want the baby's to. No, here. you're completely right you're gonna have a good time you'll be fine also i have been like being that person who keeps touching christine's no, but belly because like nobody has covid and nobody else does because like blaze is just like but i've always heard like oh like pregnant moms hate their belly being touched by people without their consent which makes sense by the way but it's like, funny because em just is never just does it anyway <laughs> I just, well. No, you have my full consent. If it were a stranger, I wouldn't go up and touch their belly, but I'm like desperate. Like, I spent. Oh, what? She's moving. I want to see. I oh, can't. shit. I just said the gender. Oh, well. Um, I feel well, like. Well, by the time this comes out, the baby will be, be here. here. Oh, by the way. Oh, was that her? Yeah. Did you feel it? That That's how I expected like a little em. alien. That's how I expected like em little, to react. It's like a little alien. It body. is like an alien. It feels like alien. Ooh. Full surprise, the sex of also, the baby. Also, if is the female. baby isn't here by the time this episode comes out, like you really need Awkward. to get into it. <laughs> it's like a month. What and if a I half tell later. the doctor, like, oh yeah, then we're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> then, what if I tell the doctor, like, I accidentally gendered the baby on air. I need this baby out now before the episode <laughs> releases. <laughs> um, excuse me, chop chop. It's Do extremely you mind? important. Um, yeah. Uh, everybody on t- Twitter today is telling me, oh, your baby's sideways. Here's what to do, and I'm like, little do you know, it's gonna come out of me in like five minutes. <laughs> You're, you're all the behind. baby is already the size of a 42 week. Yeah, newborn. yeah. The midwife was like, um, wow, this is a big baby. And I was like, since when? And then I was like, I guess I haven't been measured in like six weeks. She's like, yeah, it's measuring 42 weeks. And I'm like, that doesn't sound good for me and my body, but uh, I guess we'll find <laughs> out. Anyway, I did have my first conversation with the baby yesterday. It I, was really great. I for, bent down and I got me. real close to Christine's belly and I went, your mother's going to embarrass the shit out of you for the rest of your life. Or I said something along <laughs> No, that. you said she's so embarrassed. You said I embarrass you all the time. Oh, yeah. She embarrasses me. I was kind of just warning the baby that, like, it's going to happen to you, too. So get ready. There's a junior. Here's the cat. All right. So anyway, um, so we see. might as well get this show on the road because the baby might be outside of your belly by the end of this. By, so. by tonight. Can, can you pass me my, my Panera coffee that we Oh, by the way, we went, we went mini golfing yesterday and I had to pick up every mini golf ball that went in the hole. Okay. I was very grateful. Anymore. I kept trying to bend down and I was like, please stop you're going to injure yourself which is not wrong to su- a surprise to nobody i learned but really was affirmed that 
uh, Christine does way too much as a pregnant woman. I watched her <laughs> sprint upstairs for what? Like, well, I could have. Because Gio was on the balcony, didn't want to be anymore. That means nothing to me. <laughs> I would have been like, I'm pregnant. You can stay outside for the rest of time. <laughs> Until someone else gets home or oh, volunteers. Oh, I also booked us a really fun tour. I just want to do a little, like, shout out to our tour. We did a ghost tour yesterday. We did. A Cincinnati ghost tour. And it was really fun. And our tour guide, Mike, was really, really nice. And at the end, I was like, of course, I was like, we're podcasters. And, and he'd listened to the show. And was, he was like, I know that show. And my wife knows your show. And he's like, I've seen you in the Cincinnati Magazine. And I was like, oh, wow. That's very sweet. That's a local affair. Uh, uh, that's Do you want to shout out their company? Um, yeah. I don't want to give the wrong one. That would suck. But also there, he, it sounds like he used to have a ghost tour company when he lived somewhere else and he's new he to Cincinnati. He lived in Charleston. And did, so when he, I heard he was in Charleston, I was like, that's a haunted ass city. He probably has some ghosty experience. Yeah. So he, it sounds like he's trying to uh, revamp his company for a new city. So it's really cool. Still new, but a, it was a great, great tour. And we got great. to do actual ghost hunting at the end too. Yes, they it gave us just like K2 tour. meters. And he's like, do you know how these work? And I was like, Em and I are experts. <laughs> I was probably really obnoxious. It was called Buried Secrets and it was by Flying Pig Tours. There you go. Um, and it was super fun. Uh, it was super fun and very creepy. Um, I learned about an asylum that I didn't know existed in Cincinnati. And like we were literally in the park and he's like where I go all the time with Gio and he was like, there's a bunch of bodies down there. And I was like, cool, 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 cool. Yep. So anyway, so shout out to Mike and uh, his lovely wife, whose name I did not get. Um, and check that tour out if you're in town. Um, speaking of tours, I want to tell you that my story comes from the fact that I did a separate ghost tour only like three days earlier when I was in Denver. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was in Denver for like four days with Allison's family and then they left and I decided to stay for two days. Just I'm to doesn't like, have a home anymore. <laughs> I'm just, I'm travels. just, I fucking float around now. I'm just a jet setter. But, um, yeah, I wanted to do my own exploration as much as Allison's family is like super fun to hang out with and they've like, it's their, their interests are different than mine. So when it comes to like planning a trip, it was just not and things like that I would have done. like mini golf and ghosts is only the Yeah. If it's I not a roadside attraction, I wouldn't do it for myself. And so they were picking a <laughs> bunch of like hiking experiences, which SOS, you know how that feels to me <laughs> and my legs. Um, but so like we had a great time, but it just wasn't the stuff I wanted to do if I went to Denver. So I stayed two days and did all this other crazy stuff and one of them was a ghost tour mm -hmm. and also eva showed up at some point too and then eva was like eek i'm coming <laughs> i invited eva on the tour by the way and eva d turned it down for tacos which i understand i don't know i do I, when i heard tacos i was like oh never mind that makes sense um yeah. the ghost tour it was i was not expecting it to be two hours long in a two mile walk so that was interesting but it was very fun and i want to say if you have to go to a ghost tour ever this one was so good like specifically go to denver one <laughs> and then go and the tour was called denver terrors oh, and dear. the guide her name was sheila and she was the best um sheila did say like if you could write me a review that would be great and i was like sheila i've got a podcast sheila, everyone step aside everyone's gonna know your name so this is the opposite of beach to sandy where instead of one star reviews <laughs> i'm giving sheila like 10 out of we one love star a good reviews. redemption is what we love so it, sheila it was a gem and also i felt like uh she was an alternate reality version of me because how i was like a ghost hunter and a birthday clown she is actually a funeral director and santa claus's wife mrs claus no for christmas Christmas. no and i was like oh so you've it just is never boring for you and <laughs> like you get the vibe you get the m vibe and she was very funny she had lots of really good little one-liners and all that at one point she oh we were walking down the street i'm ruining one of your jokes i'm butchering one of your jokes sheila sorry but um <laughs> she it really tickled me we were walking down like one of the i guess more like boring streets in between two haunted locations and so i guess just to like make conversation there was a laundromat down the street and so we stopped at the laundromat and she went, this one's really creepy. Uh, this laundromat apparently is super haunted because socks always go missing. Oh my God. And I was like, <laughs> Sheila, that is what got you your tip, my friend. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, please go get Sheila from Denver Terrors. It was, she was a prize. Um, Wait, so she's a, fu what was she, a funeral She's director? an assistant funeral director oh, okay. and she is Mrs. Claus during In Christmas. In my head, I, I put, I put like clown and funeral director together and i was like oh for hire like you can hire her for a party and i guess not. for a tour go to denver terrors okay. and get sheila also maybe around december call sheila she said if this year for christmas they did zoom christmas meetings with kids Cute. and she was like it was so perfect because we could just say we were in the north pole and i was like Wait, that's such a brilliant. good idea brilliant. and nobody's close enough to pull on your beard if you're yep. santa that's yep. smart that's smart anyway uh so that's how i found out about this story 
Um, also, we it was one of the last places that she showed us, and it was one of the scarier places she showed okay. us. Okay. So this is the story of the Peabody Whitehead Mansion in Denver, Colorado. A Whitehead. <laughs> I know. I had to get through that, too. I, I definitely thought about Whiteheads the whole time. <laughs> em loves a good pimple popper video. Oh, I love... <laughs> oh, you know what? I just I just graduated in my friendship with uh, our other friend named Christine. Uh-huh. Oh, that's right. Yes, you did. I, I, well, I just graduated into another front, uh, no, new level. We unlocked a new level because she had a blackhead that she really needed me to get. And I, and I was like, actually, she I'm called really... me from a, cr- from my home. I was like, can you come over? I was so happy. And literally texted me. I was like, I actually am busy. I'm going to pop someone's <laughs> blackhead. And I was like, who's, and you oh, were like Christine's. Made... And I was like, no. And it then you were like so the happy. other Christine. I was like, thank God. Okay. Uh, there's nothing I love more than a blackhead. Oh, it Listen, you know so all happy. about my cervix apparently. And Christine's Look, there's Honestly, I would be prepared to witness your birth. I, uh, your, your baby's birth. I, I've seen it all at this point. Listen, I'm, if, I'm ready. If it weren't COVID, we could get some more plus ones in here. But I know. I just I need it for the gram. So like, I would... <laughs> no, you don't. You really don't. <laughs> okay, the Peabody Whitehead Mansion. So I'm gonna throw a trigger warning out now, um, because I will be saying the R word, and I will start well, right now. I mean, I'm, I'm always saying that word. So whether I guess if you only listen to M's half, then it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, you, yeah. I very rarely say it, and also um, I did see. I know I mentioned this in a couple episodes ago, but I have seen that there is some contention between whether or not the word rape should be inserted into the general discussion of sexual assault or if it should be separate because you don't want to like water down how bad. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to say the word rape just because, um, I saw that there were a lot of people who didn't yeah. like that we were diluting it by saying oh, sexual assault. Oh, I don't assault. dilute it, but I guess so maybe. There, I, I, guess, I, I never know I the right thing to do. Say, what do you usually say? S-A? I usually said SA, like sexual assault. Right, and, right, right. But apparently that was making it, not like, really allowing it it's in, to know how bad Detracting it is. from the, yeah. So, trigger warning, I will be saying the R word, um, and if that's not your too, thing. Me too, by the way, while we're at it, so... <laughs> So, uh, Peabody Whitehead Mansion. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's one of Colorado's most haunted houses. It is on what used to be called Millionaire's Row because it, oh, it's oh. the prettiest houses just all lined up. It was uh, it's sixty six hundred square feet, and at the time of its construction, it cost fifteen thousand dollars. Which now let me see how much that was. Not Millionaire's Row. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe uh, yeah. Back then, what was a million dollars then? That would be a. I don't know. So. Where, where's West Egg? Yeah, I trust West Egg. Sponsor me, West Egg. What's um, West Egg? Oh, is it an inflation calculator? Yeah, so $15,000 in 1889. Oh, shit. Okay, so no wonder it's a millionaire's row. So at the time, it would now be $43 million? Wait, what? What? No, you oh, I put, I put the wrong... I put oh, an extra zero. <laughs> I was like, what no, in the you world? you put two extra 15, zeros. <laughs> I was like, something doesn't feel right. Okay, here we go. Okay, it would have been... 483. So not even half a million dollars. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Losers. They were, at the, <laughs> they were at the end of Millionaire Row. They got like a corner... They were at the dead end. Not even a corner lot. They got like the back lot. <laughs> yeah. It allegedly has um, about a dozen spirits. Fun fact. Okay. So the building was uh, built in 1889 by architect Fred Edbro- Frank Edbrook, um, who also built the two other buildings that were on the tour called the Brown Palace and the Oxford Hotel. Um, and they are both also haunted. Okay. Fun fact. Wow. This guy has a streak yeah, going. Is. Can you imagine if that's your job as the architect? You're the spooky one. It's like, <laughs> whatever I do in this house, it's going to be covered that's in That's great, actually. Um, so the home was built for Dr. William Reddick Whitehead, hence the what a poor love last for, name. Love that for him. I wish he had a friend named Blackhead, and it, we could, they could have just been like visits together. That would have been the new TLC show. That would have been fun. Yeah, yeah Dr. Pimple Popper would have like been their 2. next door 0. neighbor. Yeah. Um, so Dr. William Reddick, or Riddick Whitehead, he was born in 1831 in Suffolk, Virginia, which is right next to where I went to college. Hey, yo. Um, he studied medicine, moved to Paris, and then Vienna, and then he became an army soldier during the Crimean War. Mm. Um, and then he moved back to the U.S. where he became an army surgeon again for the Civil War. Okay. For the Confederates. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> um, so he was also at different times, just to give you an idea of like his um, reputation in the medical world. Um, he was president of the Denver Medical Association. He was, on the, he was part of the Colorado State Medical Society. He helped found Denver College's School of Medicine. Um, and that's just some of them. He had like six or seven titles that make him like a Ooh. very well-known, esteemed doctor. Okay. 
Um, but during his time as a battle surgeon, even though he was a really good surgeon with a great reputation, just because of the times and the intensity of the injuries, like 90% of the people he worked on ended up dying anyway. <laughs> that's, that's not a great track record, not, bud. <laughs> including Stonewall Jackson himself. Ooh, so, that's you would hope he'd be in the ten percent, but I, ooh. <laughs> so including Stonewall Jackson, who died two weeks after surgery from Doctor Whitehead. Oh no! Um, and also many even during the Crimean War, which was one of the deadliest wars of the time, because not only was the medical treatment so bad, but there was also cholera going on at the same time. <gasps> so it was like it was other factors that caused all of these random deaths. It's not like he was so bad at his job. At least we're letting him. Off the hook in that way. That's good. It was like, well, how much can you really help after cholera? Yeah. You know? It's rough times. So he was considered super successful despite um, a mass majority of his patients dying under his care. Mm. Um, But after the wars, he retired and he moved to Denver with his wife. I think his wife was sick or something, and that's why they moved. Oh, no. Um, I think maybe with consumption, and they had to, like, go be somewhere where the air was cleaner. Oh. Something like that. Send them to the mountains. Yep. And so. Oh, wait, I guess they were. Oh, is that why they ended up? Yeah. Got it. Okay, makes sense. And so, because he was originally in New York, I think, oh, for the Civil War. Oh, got you, got you. Um, so after the wars, he retired and moved to Denver with his wife. They quickly became socialites, and he was elected to, like, city council and was on the Board of Health. So he just kept climbing that ladder. Gotcha. Um, and like I said, the house was built and finished in 1889, which is when he moved in. And he stayed in that house until he died in 1902, which was only, what, 13 years? That sounds right. Yep. And while he was there, they already had poltergeist activity in the oh, house. Oh, no. That's like, bad. Like, immediately. <laughs> so um, items would move. There'd be noises all over the house. There'd be banging. One website gave the very vague description of extreme disturbances. So there's extreme that. Extreme dis- It sounds like an extreme disturbance. And uh, the spirits, the, they were wondering where the spirits were coming from because it was a brand new house on brand new, like, yeah, well, not brand weird. new land. I'm sure it was. <laughs> brand co- new. Nobody's ever been there Brand before. new for white people. Yeah. Um, and so uh, they, the rumor is that they had poltergeist activity because, at least according to Dr. Whitehead, he thinks that the soldiers that he didn't save during <gasps> his surgeries followed him home after war i'm not gonna lie this sounds a lot like winchester like the yeah. all the victims are like or, still like, following like you. victims uh, under your hand yeah or by your brand or something <sighs> so he thinks that a lot of the activity was because he was the one that in, yeah. in his mind he said he felt probably felt guilty for quote killing them or not saving them and therefore right. killing them um and what's interesting is after dr whitehead died in the house changed owners the activity did die down so oh it, that is weird so it was attached to him seemingly that's what it the, okay. how the story goes that it kind of confirms that they were attached to that him that would be rough if you were like a 90 percent failure rate no, okay failure rate is yeah. extreme wording but you know <laughs> like 90 percent of your patients died like they ser- yeah they certainly didn't thrive after oof, the surgery i mean that's you gotta live with that i guess so uh one person who did die in the house her name was either eloise or ella and uh the main story is that she was an employee of Dr. Whitehead's and they got really close and he thought of her as a daughter and took her in. Um, some people say that she was just a random woman that she was getting married. And the, the main story is that he offered his house to her as the venue for free. Oh, that's nice. But there, I heard other versions of the story where she was just a random person renting out the space as a okay, wedding venue. But either way, she was like using it for a wedding. Yeah. But the main story goes that they knew each other and he, they were friends. Okay. Um, and I guess like Kel Surprise, she was a jilted bride. The husband didn't show up at the wedding. And so now you can see a woman in white. Go fucking figure. Oh my God. Our tour guide yesterday had a really great theory, which I really liked. I liked it a lot. I thought that was really interesting. He said, um, he's cause, cause I joked, he said something about a girl in white and I was like, oh my God, um, there's another girl in white. There's always a woman in white or a woman in red. And he said, uh, or black or whatever, and he said, oh, well, I've always thought, like, maybe that's just how our, our I can't perceive the color of it, or or yeah. they appear as, like, a grayscale or black and white, and that's why we see it as white, and I was like, fascinating. Or, yeah, or maybe there was, like, they, when they thought of themselves as photographs or memories, they oh, thought right, of themselves true. in grayscale, because they didn't see color portraits. Black and white photos. So maybe they thought they could project the best version they knew how. Um, but, yeah, so, Jilted Bride. And uh, apparently she ended up uh, dying by suicide in the basement. She Mm. hanged herself on some of the pipes in the basement. Terrible. Um, 
And so that's the only immediate death connected to him. I think he might have died in the house, Dr. Whitehead. Mm -hmm. But other than him, um, the only deaths up until now is Ella. That's a pretty traumatic one, though. Pretty traumatic, especially if they were friends, too. That's true, too. Yeah. Um, So in 1902, this is when Dr. Whitehead died. And it... The house was then taken over by Governor James H. Peabody. Okay. Who moved in and rented the home for two years because he was the governor, but there wasn't an official governor's mansion in Colorado at the time. Okay. Um, so he, I think, just picked that house. He was like, <laughs> this that's, is mine now. That's a nice one that's vacant. <laughs> okay. So. Um, fun fact, Governor Peabody was one of the most hated governors at that Why point in U.S. history. Why is such a fun name? He, he will also hate him because Uh-oh. he was against labor unions for minors and he ended up being a... <laughs> That's so specifically bad. <laughs> Not just against anti-union, but anti-child union. No, my, minors. Oh <laughs> my God. <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, that's really extreme. Okay, okay. They're like coal miners. (laughs) That makes sense. Wrap it up, everybody. Wrap up the laughter. I get it. (laughs) For true crime, I understand you would think miners Miners. like children. Jeez, okay. All right. He like really hated child labor laws. That's Um, why I was like, damn, what an extra (laughs) asshole. Like, at least let the children take some time off work. Okay. No, okay. He was against He was against labor unions for coal Miners. miners. Okay, got you. Sorry. That was totally my bad. No, I should have known. I just took that into a whole fun direction for myself. <laughs> All right. Someone's got a baby on the brain. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so he ended up becoming a big part of what is now known as the Ludlow Massacre, <gasps> which is at least a little better now knowing children aren't involved. Yeah, in I'm, I'm pleased about that. Thank you for correcting me. Um, so in, 19, uh, in 1914, I think it was, there, are, there were 1,200 coal miners who were on strike with their families in Ludlow, Colorado. And um, basically people who owned the mines didn't want to hire union workers. They would have preferred to hire non-union workers because it would have been cheaper. Sure. So to keep these owners from hiring outside of the city and finding new uh, non-union laborers, the people that were – the miners that were in unions decided that they were going to barricade the rail lines so that nobody could come into town and take their jobs. Ooh, okay. All right. No scabs allowed. So uh, Peabody was somehow involved in this as well as one of the coal and iron companies. Um, they collectively, I think, hired like a thousand militiamen and the National Guard came out to arrest people um, and attack these coal miners that were in the mountains. And basically like at least 13 men, women, and children were killed. Oh, jeez. Because the, the miners were out there. Was miners and miners. Miners and miners. Yikes. Miners with their families. So Bad, bad, bad. So he basically, like, it was like he declared martial law, basically, Ooh, and sent scary. out militia on his own townspeople. And anyway, labor unions ended up losing anyway, and non-union miners got hired. So bad, bad, bad. Didn't even work out. So some of the miners wanted revenge, fun fact, and tried to blow up his house, but they apparently only blew up his porch, <laughs> um, which sounds like not a great miner to me, by the way. They're supposed to know how to like blast dynamite into rocks, and they only got like three feet in front of them. But anyway, that was only one of two assassination attempts on Peabody. Okay. So, but he ha- tried to get killed twice. Like there, he tried to get killed. People tried to kill him twice. Right, so that right, he's right. not a great. It's guy. not a good look. Yeah. Um. Mm-hmm. So. Others suggest that the spirits in this house actually are from when Governor Peabody was there. Okay. Um, some say that the reason for the continual paranormal activity is because of his n- intense negative energy still carrying over, mm. but also because, so it could either be Whitehead's patients mm-hmm. from the war. It could be the just negative energy or the people that Peabody was involved in, in killing. Right. Um, it could also be because Peabody hated, uh, like, y- labor unions so much. Th- this becomes a weird theory, but roll with it for now. <laughs> that after um, he ended up leaving, it became a bunch of things, but eventually becomes restaurants. Oh. And one of the theories, you'll understand why. If you're confused at all, just give me a second and I'll explain it later. But they think that anytime there were employees in the building... Governor Peabody would hate it because they might have been part of a labor union in some way. Oh, no. Um, I will get more into that in a second, and you'll <laughs> totally understand what I'm talking about. So um, by the, the mid-1900s, so between the 50s and 70s, the building was rebought and turned into apartments, and then it became roughly 10-ish bars and restaurants over time. Okay. 
Um, I had a list of all the names of them, but I, I, it, some of them were, they seemed tough to pronounce. I just didn't even want to risk it. So just say, let's say about 10 restaurants and bars. Okay. One of them, though, uh, opened Halloween 1983, and it was literally called Spirits. Fun, fun. Love it. Love it. Love a good double entendre. Love it. Also, fun fact, in Fredericksburg, Spirits is Deirdre's favorite bar. Really? It's a great um, name for a bar, I'm not going to lie. It's a great one. Um, it's also, like, a very old building where the floor has not been, like, fixed since the, like, Fantastic. 1800s. So when you stand up there, you can feel the floor, like, moving with you, and you're three flights up, and you're just, like, at any moment, we're Deirdre, all Deirdre, gonna... you are full of just fun times. It's Deirdre as a building. Like, yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. Risky. I feel like I can just, <laughs> just... I can see it now. So It's uh, just a risky. It's a lot of fun, but you get a little scared sometimes. Just, just like, fun with Deirdre. It's always a roller coaster. So, um... Yeah, so there was a bar, and it closed in less than a year, um, right. which most of these establishments did. Um, and they have said anytime this establishments have closed out of this building, it was because of the ghosts and because of the activity. Oh, so they're not even... Not even hiding it. Wow, okay. So during all these renovations, the old poltergeist activity came back because it's switching like at least every year into a different restaurant. Right. Um, or even when it was an office space, it was being renovated too. Um, but silverware... silverware and kitchen tools, like pots and pans, furniture, would all get thrown into walls or across the room. Dishes would break. Apparently, glasses would break. Even just, like, sitting on the bar, they would just shatter out of nowhere. Super. Um, trays would move. I mean, it was... Apparently, there was um, old servants' bells that weren't even connected to anything anymore, but people would hear that them ringing. That is scary. I don't like that. It's like residual sounds. Yeah. And there was one that we heard on the tour where... One of the restaurant managers said that one of the chandeliers, like, all of it was glowing except for one light bulb, and it always flickered. Yeah. And so they were like, you have to fix the chandelier. It's always flickering. And when he – it had been flickering for, a long, like, weeks. Yeah. And the electrician finally comes in and was like, this chandelier's never been connected to anything. <gasps> <laughs> so for it to have been lit at all. Ew. Yeah. Ew. Ew. It's <laughs> yucky. I don't like that. My personal favorite is when it was spirits. Yeah. Um, one of the cooks in the back says that a whole bottle of beer somehow spilled all down his back, <gasps> even though nobody was down That's in the kitchen with him. so uncomfortable. But it was because he said something homophobic. Oh, well, there you go. You, why, wait, so why so would these you even some, admit that, by the way? Yeah, I, I don't know. But I saw that on a few websites. So, like, it's, like, a, apparently a well-known source, in which case, like, thank you to the, maybe, whatever like, ally ghost that was. Maybe the chef was watching and was like, he deserved that. Let yeah. me tell you. He's like, you know what? I hope you, I hope that happened. So, wow. Um, also during these renovations, this is where the R word comes in. Um, during these renovations, I think when it was switching from one restaurant to another in the seventies, um, either two strange men or what I saw from one source is two of the construction workers from the renovation, um, saw a girl walking home past the building and they grabbed her and she was raped in the alley and they killed her and she was buried in the basement of the house. Oh no mid renovation oh no so while the house has and we're gonna get back to that um not to like give you such a strong (laughs) sentence and then like leave you hanging but um we will get back to that in a second so while the house has been different office spaces people have still witnessed activity including books that fall uh, off their own shelves um apparently there's this is a very specific one Um, i'm just going to quote it Numbers appearing by themselves on a calculator in a locked office. It which said 80085. It said boobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, papers will move themselves. Furniture will move. People hear a baby crying. People have seen different apparitions in there, standing in different windows. Um, books are moving again. People have seen, or they've felt getting pushed against walls. People will often get sick really quickly or faint or feel really ill in some way and need to leave and the second they leave they feel fine oh that's good at least but it's in some way they have like a panic attack or feel really drained with their energy right um on the first floor of the women's bathroom there is apparently an apparition of an older man who smells really strongly of um tobacco Mm. i think cherry tobacco um and people have seen him smoking a pipe okay in the second floor men's bathroom Ella has apparently been seen in the mo- in the mirrors. Oh no! Yeah, yikes. sorry, love you, girl, but like, no, no mirror stuff, please <laughs> no, for no, no, me. No, no, I'm no, not no, into no. that. Apparently, she just generally haunts the second floor. But she, one of the stories I heard is that she gets jealous 
of the jealous of the waitresses getting hit on by men or she's protecting the waitresses getting hit on by men. Um, yeah, that's quite a different angle. The way that it was phrased <laughs> is that she was jealous, but like for all we know, she was like trying to be protective. Yeah. Um, and literally a table that the guy was sitting at flew up like a foot off the ground while he was still sitting there. So the whole table, like you're at She's like, like a Ruby Tuesdays dare. and the table just goes whomp. And you're just, oh, and it fell back down. And it fell back down. Like, it got Love thrown. That. Like, she was, like, almost, like, trying to knock him away or something. Love that. Um, apparently, wine bottles will shatter. Oh, boy. Um, you, you know, the usual restaurant the stuff. Usual things get moved. things that make employees miserable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Imagine having to go tell your manager, like, the, the tables are flying everywhere. <laughs> I don't know. Can I just go home, please? Um <laughs> And so in the basement, there's also, I didn't mention this death earlier, but there's another person who apparently hanged themselves in the basement. And it was a woman who worked there after closing hours and she went down and did it with her own apron. And what? That's really fucked That's up. That's horrible. Yeah. So I'm sure there's activity in the well, basement. Well, this basement there too. is fucking terrible. Yeah. Two deaths down there and a and body's a body. been buried down there. Yeah. So, um, today the house is vacant, um, and has been in the middle of renovations for five years and it is in the middle of being turned into apartments, including the <laughs> basements. Good luck. Including the basements. Including the basement. I said this on the tour. I was like, imagine being like, uh, like you're in your apartment and you're like, like he overhearing through the window, a ghost tour. And you hear that someone was buried in yeah, your yeah, basement, yeah, 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 yeah. in your room, in your apartment. So, um. Yeah, it's turning into apartments now. And you're like someone hanged themselves from that rafter and you're like, Where my where my 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 portrait of my dog hangs? Right. I'm trying to think of like what you would put on a fucking wall, but like wow. Well anytime like maybe if it's like the ceiling, like maybe like the lights move or something, like the oh. like a hanging I don't know. But if anything happened in that house it was what happened last night? What was he saying on that tour about there yeah. was there he was, was talking about an apartment building, and he said there was one time they went through, and there was a woman on the fire escape kind of watching the tour and having a cigarette or a drink or something, and she, like, kind of, her, her eyes were getting wider because he was describing. Well, someone was murdered in her, yeah, her room. this horrible murder that occurred, and she's sitting outside her apartment like, wait, what? And I guess uh, the he people. He moved out the next day or yeah, something. Yeah, the people who lived there, I guess, have always had weird stuff happen, and so the next week they did the same tour on the same day of the week, and the apartment was, they looked up, and it was completely vacant, <laughs> and they were like, and I, I thought it was a good point that, like, it probably wasn't just the first time she'd ever heard anything weird. She probably had some shit going on. She was on probably like, and oh, it... that's why the floor creaks every night. And that's yeah. why this, Ugh. my pic, he was talking about how pictures get, like. Oh, the pictures on the walls? Chills. That was rough. He Apparently, said, there was uh, one guy who lived there before her came home one day and all the chairs were stacked on each other like a poltergeist. And all the. He went on, like, a portraits... two-day retreat and came home. And, yeah. And all the portraits on the walls had been turned the other way. Yeah, they were still, still hanging, hanging but they were facing the wall which i was like that's bad. that's that's the, pulled that is shit. absolutely and of course the story Satan. behind it is horrific like it's like a nun who w worked with the who school was being district stalked by a guy and who got killed by like an unstable person down the hall with a gun I who mean, also held people at hostage like on live tv or something yeah you look Crazy. at the articles i was like how do i not know this shit you need to cover that i should cover that that was a wild one um, but yeah, so now the house is vacant. I can tell you with my own eyes, it is certainly not going to be open anytime soon. It was Does it like, look like fancy. I love when they're always I like, took a picture for you. Oh, sweet. Cause I, I love dark. when they're really upscale and you're like, there's someone's going to spend so much money to be miserable in that place. I was thinking though, like maybe it's like, oh, I guess in Colorado, it's the same thing where you don't have to mention if someone died. Yeah. Apparently you don't have to. Cause Ohio. I was going to say like, think about the deal you could at least score if like you live in the most haunted section of the house. I don't know. Yeah. But I guess if other people don't believe it or don't care, yeah. there's always someone else who'll take it. Um, here, where was it? Yeah. I learned um, in Cincinnati, you don't need, or in Ohio, you don't need to declare that to people. Fun fact. Yeah. It's super dark. It was just because it was night <gasps> out. But it's a massive house. Oh, it's house. creepier looking than I expected. Everything Why is it so pointy? Everything in Colorado had like gabled roofs. I mean, really, really pointy. Really, like that, if you fell on the exact center of the roof, you would get, you'd like, get stabbed all right the way through. Half. Yeah, you would literally get sliced. It, like, you could tell, like, oh, just looking at the picture, I'm afraid to touch it because I'm afraid it I'll looks get sliced. Point pointy. It's very sharp. That's a creepy looking building. And it's, like, got all these gates around it. It's still, like, very much in the middle of being built. Um, wow. Well, good luck to whoever lives there. So here's my, here's the thing that really freaked me out about this story on the ghost tour, because I was like, okay, like it's a haunted house. And like, yeah, someone died there or two people died there and someone was buried there. Super creepy. 
And she ended up taking us across the way, which let me get my phone out again. So here's one building that I'm about to talk about. It's called the Dan Sheedy House. Okay. And again, it's like super dark, so you can't Ugh. see anything right now. But so it's a it's one of those houses where it's not just a flat front. It's kind of angled out. So like there's like windows that are kind of diagonally yeah, facing yeah, yeah. out, if that makes sense. Like it's not bay like, windows, sort of? Like bay windows, yeah. yeah. So here's a bay window on the front oh, of the Dan Sheedy house, which is across from the Peabody Whitehead. So going across the way, you can see the house, right? Oh, that's the pointy house. That's the pointy okay, house. Okay, got it. So it's like across the street yeah, and like one like house over. Yeah, it's like catty corner a little bit, yeah. So um, at the Sheedy Mansion, or it's apparently also called the Grant Street Mansion, um, there are windows by the front door that can see the Peabody Whitehead Mansion. And apparently that house is also haunted, but it the creepiest ghost there is an apparition of a woman in the windows who is staring at you, looking very scared, and her mouth is moving like a mile a minute, like she's trying to say something no, no, to no, you. No, 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 no. And she's pointing no. at the Peabody Whitehead house. Is she in the house? She's in the the Sheedy Mansion, like almost like looking out the window to oh, the Peabody house. Oh, and you can see her house. from outside. And yeah. Oh, And no. she's freaking out and like pointing at the house. And so the story goes that it's a residual haunting of the woman who witnessed the murder. <gasps> And she was trying to get someone's attention of, like, help her, help her. I know. I know. What the fuck? Um... That one freaks me out. It, like, the way that the, that the tour guide was talking about it was, like, that the ghost in that house is absolutely involved in that house. The fact that it's, like, speaking word. I mean, that's Like, freaky. so fast. Like, that's apparently, freaky. like, she's trying to desperately get someone to look out the window and see what she's seeing. And also how sad that that's, like, the lingering memory. Well, also, how powerful is the haunting in yeah. House 1 that it's spread into another house? And it, like, and continues the loop or whatever. And it's still connected in some way. Horrible. So, anyway. I, Did uh, anybody live in that shitty mansion? Or is it, like, a... I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Because that would blow. <laughs> that would really blow. If in the middle of the night, you just hear a woman downstairs freaking out. Or you out. hear people outside going, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, truly, truly. So, um, people, yeah, so people have said that they've seen a, a woman in the windows. Mm -hmm. um, and so, now I'm going to go back to the, speaking of that murder mm -hmm. of the woman, I'm going to... Or I guess maybe she only saw her getting attacked. I don't I don't know what she saw, but the the theory is that she witnessed the woman clearly not consenting to whatever's going on. Right. Um so let's get back to that story because one of the first things that Sheila said on this tour is that the Peabody Whitehead had an episode of Ghost Adventures. Yes. So I had to and go check it like, out. And you were like, I'm in. I was like, and we are locked and loaded, Sheila. <laughs> Sheila, you got me. You got me hook, line, and sinker. And we're in the mainframe, Miss Sheila. So um so Zach's main storyline in Ghost Adventures was he kind of ignored all the other ghosts and he mainly wanted to get to the bottom of this, this like not potential murder, very real murder. Right, right. He um, ignored all the great. He was like, I, let's just, uh, his whole storyline was like, we want to figure out what the fuck happened to yeah. this girl and where is she? And if she I was mean, buried fair. in the basement, like what happened to her? So um, it starts though with a completely different storyline. So when we were in TV together, we learned, it, we were both in comedy Not script on writing. TV, to be clear. In, in, in TV. TV class. Being told we'll never be on TV, <laughs> right. to be clear. Yeah. Um, we, our first real class, well, our second class we took together, but the first one I remember you in uh, was script writing. Oh, yeah. What was his name? Mr. Lohan or something? It was something like L. Yeah, start yeah. with an L. <laughs> Loman? Lo Loman? That sounds right. I don't know. Wow. Um, I forget. We had to write a modern family spec script together. Yes, that was yes, yes. Fun. I slept the whole time in class. <laughs> uh, can confirm. I sat next to M sleeping the whole time. It was the first. I think that's why I remember you more because it was the first time I actually sat next to you in yeah, a class. Yeah, we sat next to each other. And I, every time you came in, I was like, is M okay? <laughs> like, is this person okay? I was reverse cycling like you your really baby might. You really slept the entire. <laughs> you'd put your backpack on the thing and just like pass out. And I was like, well. And then they were like, so Christine, you have to write a script with M. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also it was like. I was that shitty kid in a group project and Christine probably did all the work. It was, I don't even remember that. But it was like 11 a.m. And I was like, wow, M just goes to bed at 11 a.m. I mean. I sure do. That's exactly correct. So, um. One thing we learned in script writing was like a, like an A storyline, B storyline, sometimes a C storyline right. based on how many characters are in the show. And I feel like someone who writes scripts wrote this Ghost Adventures episode because it felt like there was an 
A plot, B plot, C plot. Ooh. So the an A plot is usually the main storyline. The B is like the secondary characters in that episode having right. their own storyline. And then sometimes there's a C plot, which is like the tiniest thing, but gets it five gets minutes like of the episode. Mentioned again near the end. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so there was a the C plot was that while he was trying to while Zach was trying to get research on this house, he ends up going to like the University of Colorado Denver and talking to a professor but students recognize him on campus and they're like there's this haunted brewery on campus you have to go so there's like a weird five minutes of this whole show or is dedicated to him like investigating something he didn't even mean to investigate on the show (laughs) okay um the b plot is that the b plot and the a plot are pretty much they have the same amount of time it feels like um but one of the rumors of this house is that businesses always fail and one of them is because peabody didn't like uh-huh. employees or worker unions, labor unions. And so he was in some way like, like sabotaging them, or somehow something? sabotaging them or getting into their psyche and ruining their careers. I, it was a weird storyline to run <laughs> okay. with, but okay. So um, basically Zach was told that any businesses that open here close very quickly. The waiters are clumsy, for example, or they like get scared of the kitchen and don't want to go in there. So they don't get their job done fast enough. And potentially the ghost of Peabody is bothering the workers because he doesn't want them to succeed. Okay. Okay. So the B storyline That's their here motivation. <laughs> Got it. Okay. The is, foil. Is that Zach decides that he's going to do an experiment with the crew where oh, he God. basically gets five sets of five rounds of Postmates. <laughs> I do, we did that experiment all the time. <laughs> We're great at that experiment. Um, he decided that he was going to hire that for one night a uh, a restaurant staff of a waiter and a waitress. <laughs> oh my God, okay. And he was going to have him, Aaron, and I don't know who else was there, all sit in the pitch black and do a ghost investigation while they are being catered to. I and love having this dinner. idea. I'd like to follow up on this <laughs> and just like sit down and have someone cater for me. So we hired a waiter and a waitress to serve them in hopes to piss off Peabody that there were two workers this back at really it in the house. Strange angle, but okay. He also said that for the sake of like the the I don't know what the right word would be, but to make sure that there was no contamination or anything the waiter and waitress had no idea that this house was haunted these people are like why are we here i was gonna say okay but you're a a one waiter and one waitress in a massive fucking six plus thousand square foot house yep in the dark in it on his like a historical millionaire's row in the pitch fucking black serving zach bagans and his crew with cameras pointing at every fucking angle but he they have no idea what's going on they would never guess they thought this might be like an Animal Planet special. Like, what do you think they think is going on? I mean, come on. Christine, the waitress literally says, and I quote, to Zach while she's serving him, is this supposed to be the most haunted location in Denver? And then even the waiter comes up later and says, yeah, this place is supposed to be really haunted. Like, <laughs> like so they're not like, stupid, right? Like, okay, they're, like, talk about contaminating, like, the innocence of this waiter this and waitress. Is, there's no placebo. F- yeah, this is not working. So in their five rounds of food that they had delivered to them and <laughs> they were served, um surf be my taco bell like in the what? pitch black uh the only thing that happens is that an orb flies into zach's head and he feels something grab him at the same time and then the waiters say that they feel off which like fucking duh yeah like, <laughs> i would i feel off just hearing about this if you didn't feel off like what kind of other restaurants have you been yeah, serving you, you work for a weird catering company um interestingly ish according to zach at least it was interesting that the wait staff started really moving slower and they started saying that they were like freaking out and they were they were getting more scared but like i'm sure placebo effect of yes, being exactly. on ghost mentors also by that point it's like 3 a.m of course you're moving and slower this is your fifth meal you're serving <laughs> these people and uh basically the cameras show that they're quote avoiding the kitchen but maybe like i don't know how tv shows are written maybe they were just like they were about to go home or something i'm not sure yeah they also did get a female EVP saying the word waitress. Oh. So, okay. All right. That's something. A storyline. The A storyline is that Zach is super invested in trying to debunk the story of the abducted girl. Debunk it? Or figure out what happened. Oh, oh, oh. Um, and so, what do you do when you need to figure out the story of an abducted girl who was buried in the basement? You bring on a guest star who is a UFC fighter named Brendan Schaub. What? I don't know who wrote this episode, but it was very that went not from, like li- A to like seven. <laughs> like it didn't even go to a letter; it just went like to a different <laughs> alphabet. It went from H to hashtag to like nothing that makes sense. Um, 
yeah, so I don't know what deal Brendan Schaub scored to be like a guest star on this, this episode. This is like when Catfish hires a random like MTV. Well, celebrities. that makes sense because someone like had a baby or Max is directing an episode, but this was just like <laughs> Zach wanted to bring on another big scary muscly dude to watch him get scared. I don't know. He probably is just a UFC fan and was like, "This is my chance." You maybe know? I don't know, or maybe like the UFC fighter had a really good manager and he was like, "I like Zach Bagans. Get me on the show." Well, okay. He, by the way, was not invited to the five course meal. So what? Um. So this UFC fighter, they all go into the basement together to investigate the girl's murder. And I will say their spirit box, they use a spirit box to talk to the ghost. And it was actually pretty scary. Okay. I would have been scared. The spirit box always freaks me out. It, it was very weird. And also they were clear. It was clear audio, not like the normal garbled shit. You have to kind of guess, like maybe the producers made this they seem like it's it scary. Yeah. No, this was like, I would be scared. I would yeah. be very scared. So the, um, they asked, can you tell us what your name is? And the spirit box said, Pete. Okay. Then someone said, are you a nice guy or a mean guy? And the spirit box said, watch it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> in which case I'd be like, you got it, my friend. And yep. I would call an Uber. Pete, got your message Pete, loud and clear. See you never. So um, <laughs> then they said, what happened to the girl down here? And the spirit box said she was raped. And very what? clearly. It said that sentence? Very oh, clearly, no. yeah. Um, Did they play that on air? Oh, yikes. yeah. Okay. And uh, so then they asked who raped her. Yeah. And the spirit box said it was, and then it sounded like the name like wit or wit or skip or like something that, with that kind of sound. It was one syllable. It was wit. Yeah. Um, so we don't, I don't totally know the name. Um, I just assumed like wit, like Whitney or I don't know. Yeah. Um, did you witness the next question they asked? Did you witness the rape? And the spirit box said, it is violent here. Holy mother. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. Also, I was watching it alone in a hotel room, so I was really freaked out. Um, They said, are there bodies, are there any bodies buried here and where? And so the story that even I was told on the tour is that they buried her in the basement, but the, I guess the way that the building used to be and constructed was that part of the basement was underneath what is the alley outside. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so technically it's like not in the house cause it's kind of jutted out underground and it would be underneath the street. Okay. So, um, they said, are there any berries bodied here and where? And the berries spear box bo- said, bodied ber- where is the, you said <laughs> any berries bodied. Are there, sorry. Are there any bodies buried here and where? Right. And the spear box said street. Ooh. ooh. Um, so Zach starts walking towards the, the wall that leads to the alley. Right. And the spirit box said, found it. <laughs> oh, no. No, 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 no. And then um, they ended up later on that same wall finding a crawl space. So all the Zach, the Zach adventures, yikes. <laughs> the, the Zach crew, the Ghost Adventures crew, they later found a call. Uh, not really found it, but they walked up to where they saw a crawl space in the wall. Yeah. Next to the alley. The ghost had found it. And the body could have been buried there. So Zach got a picture. And he did find like a weird purple mist in the crawl space. Ew. Um, so the, as they're walking over to the crawl space. Or while um, the rest of the people are walking and following Zach over to the crawl space. The spirit box says the words, he's scared. <laughs> and they say, who's scared? Called out. They say, who's scared? And in a completely different voice, they say, Brendan. The UFC fighter. <gasps> I forgot who that was. <laughs> the UFC guy. <laughs> and like they say it's very clearly again. Like it's like it's a little either like a little girl's voice or a female voice going like Brendan. Like who's scared? Duh. Yeah, duh. It's Big B. So um Yuck. And the episode basically ends with them leaving Brendan in the basement alone. <gasps> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> that's kind really? of it. It's like the, it's nothing not else happens nice. afterwards. But so that's the story of the Peabody Whitehead Mansion oh, in Denver, my Colorado. God, ew. Ew, 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 ew. That yeah. one gave me some goose camp, though. I will say that Ghost Adventures episode at the end was a little freaky. Yeah. So the, like the first half of it with like the, the dining the experience and like the. The I just feel like they had to prove why they expensed it, and that's why they kept it on the episode. I yeah, <laughs> they were like, their business manager was like, "Are you sure that you are you sure you needed this?" Actually, yeah, very yeah. important B plot. Huh. Anyway, so there you have it. Nice work. And we're back. 
round two, how was your midwife appointment? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still here and I'm still pregnant, so. Oh, uh, wow. We had, uh, even I had a good time. I snooped through Christine's things. Um, and I was actually very disappointed. I was so disappointed. Well, okay, so I did find your journals, but I knew better than to open them. I didn't open them. I do thoroughly appreciate that because. Um, I'm sure there's something embarrassing in there. There's no way you have a journal from childhood and there's, there's not something good. a lot. And also, those are probably not even from childhood. They're probably from, like, the last three years. So, mm, I'm probably in them. So, now, actually, I wish the I looked at The statute of limitations is not up on those. Don't check um, it. <laughs> but so, I was, um, I so, one of the things I'm learning about Christine's house is that every single room has, like, very weird multiple offshoots. <laughs> yes, it does. Like, alcoves, cubby like holes. Like, this room, you wouldn't know, spaces. but on the other side of this wall, right here, also, we got smoothies. Um, <laughs> on this wall, there's a room that's like a mass, like, I don't know what to call it because it's too small to be a bedroom, but it's way too big to be a closet. Right. It's way too big. It's like, uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know. It's, you can fit a bed in there because on the other side, there's the exact same thing with the, in the exact same size. So and there is a bed in A there. queen size actually fits in there. But the bed fits exactly. Like you can't, there's nothing you can put on either side yeah, of the bed. You kind of just have to crawl. If you have to reach the printer or whatever's over there, you have to crawl across the bed to get there. So that's what happened. So that was <laughs> where I found your bin of goods that I was trying to snoop through. What? What's over there? No, there was like on the other side of the bed, there was a Tupperware and that's where I found like all your journals and stuff. Oh, fun. Did you know that's there? I do now. So I was trying to crawl over the bed to like put it back because I was bored. There was nothing in there except all of your straight A report cards, <laughs> fucking nerd. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> M literally, Eva sends me a photo and says, M is proud of you. And it was M holding like my participation volleyball trophy from middle school. And I was like, what? Fun fact, Christine was on the dean list every single <laughs> semester of college. And her worst grade was three solid Bs. I, my mom was so mad at me about that. She I am mad at you she too because. She still talks about it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, a B was the best I could do. Um, anyway, I had to like crawl, army crawl on the bed to get the, the Tupperware on the other <laughs> side be, to put it back when I was done with it. And I was like, I'm just going to lie down. I mean, it, I'm too tired now. It was like, got on the mattress and was like, all right. I just, it was like, by in. the way, it was a Helix mattress. So, um, <laughs> promo code drink or something. And, uh, I was just lying there and I was like, wow, I'm just like vibing. I'm having such a good time just lying down here. <laughs> Poor Eva. Eva's, what's she doing? She's out here. Eva like, was just sitting here. Like, okay, bye, Em, I So guess. Eva like looked around the door, the the door frame and was like, you having a good time in here? And I, I guess while we were talking for a second, the bed is not next to the, you, this is in this room where the mattress is, is also where. Uh, Christine does her cricket machine. Listen, if while we're throwing out everything embarrassing about me, yes, that is my cricket machine room. And so what is that? What would you call that lazy Susan of material? The fabric thing? Oh, yeah, my vinyl. Okay. My vinyl carousel. So, okay, so you've got a vinyl carousel. <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> Let me show people. Can I grab it? Yes, absolutely. It used to just be all over the floor, so at least I have it sort of organized. I bought it at Michael's, my little carousel. This is what I bought to make you close with. So... This it's, is a t-shirt. It's vinyl. a lazy Susan. So I, it's next to the bed. So while I'm lying on the bed and, and Eva shows up. Uh -huh. Eva Wait, was, what happened? Now I'm like freaking out. I was sitting there and we were just talking and this was not touching the bed. I wasn't near this thing, but all of a sudden it started doing this all by Wait, itself. Wait, are you serious? All by itself. Spinning. Wait, what? Like a Wait, and rotation. you saw this too? Cause Eva pointed it out behind me. She was like, why is that spinning by itself? And Wait, I and turned the, around. The cat wasn't here? No. <gasps> Ew, what? It was spinning all by itself. And Eva was like, why is it spinning? And I looked over and it was fully rotating by itself. Eva's making the eek face and I don't and like it. And then I looked over and like we checked to see like, oh, was there a gap? Like maybe when I rolled over on the mattress sure. I sit and push it, nothing. It, there was a huge space well, between Well, that's it. never moved and it's never, it's never moved all from that itself. spot and it's never moved by itself. That's for sure. All by itself. Like it did a full by itself and then rolled back on itself by itself. Are you, are you for real? I'm not kidding. And that's why I sprinted out of the bedroom. Well, what's weird is that, like, if that happened when I was here, I would be able to hear it and see it. So I don't know. Like, that's not something that's ever happened before. I don't like that. Well, okay. I didn't realize that happened when I was gone. It, All I heard was, one, I'm disappointed in the lack of go gossip I found in your, in your, I guess, Dean's List report cards. And B, <laughs> there's a ghost in your closet. It, no, it did. Ha it really freaked me out. I was like, that's a very, it felt super intentional. <laughs> and also, I had just been in the room, like, totally vibing. So maybe it felt, like, super chill and safe to, like, try something. Or maybe Eva showed up and it was like, get out. We're vibing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you just, like, ruined the vibe. Harsh the vibe. But, Harsh uh, the mellow. But anyway, what? so that happened. And that's why I came over here. God and then damn it. You guys show up and all of a sudden. By the way, the place that I 
left the helix mattress for was this little nook in, in the <laughs> it's on now the other called side M's right there nook. yeah best nap of it's my life it's like a window life. seat with an air conditioner unit and oh my God, it was a so zach good. bagan's blanket it's m's new i didn't spot. care that eva was here i woke up and christine was here from her midwife appointment i was like my cervix blah 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 and m's just like passed the hell out anyway if you ever like i don't know end up in christine's house that's the nook to take a Please nap don't in. T- end up in my house step one but if you do yeah, if you did guess, just go into that nook. i guess you'll, you'll find it you'll know it spot. it looks cozy so it's it's now has a big label M's spot. It also no. is a big dent from where my big ass body was lying for the last two hours. So now we're finishing the story. Anyway. So carry it away, Christine. So we're gonna do this. I'm drinking a pine some pineapple smoothie. I'm gonna uh, have some dates and some uh, spicy food. M wants to uh, we're gonna do meet whatever, the baby whatever, before they leave. So we're gonna do whatever we can. I want to catch the baby on its way uh, out. Oh, uh, sorry. M wants to deliver the baby. I guess. <laughs> Look again. I did watch TikTok for all of quarantine. I know how to deliver a baby at this point. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <TikTok>. so, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I don't think that last well, sentence makes me feel very good. If anything, Dwight Schrute did teach me that babies are slippery. So <laughs> I at least know that to catch He's it in like, my shirt I or something. It in butter. <laughs> the world. Oh yikes! Okay. Um. All right. So let's tell me about a really horrid thing instead of us being happy. Okay. Fantastic. I actually have like a pretty wild one today that I feel like you'll get like jazzed yeah or like gasp you know Ooh, what i mean somebody gad. said that when i told you i forget what i think it might have been casey anthony that you were like <gasps> your gasps were like oh epic so thank you i didn't know that we'll see i'm excited to do it again um i felt like it was a compliment to me because i was like finally getting you like as like jazz do you know what i mean well let's try it let's all right let's it try again. this is the story of michael and <sighs> susan bear carson okay uh aka the san francisco witch killers Ooh, <laughs> I do like San Francisco and I do like witches. I do not like killers. So two out of three. Yeah. Well, witch killer is, I feel like a double bad then. Um, Ooh. Cause they're killers and they kill witches. Uh, well, Ooh. well, oh. we'll get there. Spoiler alert. So okay. uh, the, th- I think the best summation of this case uh, is a sentence from film daily, which uh, goes as follows. When Debar says James Clifford Carson and Susan Barnes met, things got pretty weird pretty fast. So that's the that's the opening Fair enough. opening line to this movie. <clears throat> Sorry, Ooh, and now place. a door is creaking. Is it the little girl in your Who room? Spins my vinyl <laughs> Who carousel. To, was it a, the ghost of a cricket? Maybe. How embarrassing! I feel like if I called Jim Harold's campfire, I'd be like, I have a vinyl. Uh, carousel i feel like people would just immediately tune out my like, lazy susan just spins my lazy all the time susan of cricket materials so embarrassing <clears throat> okay <clears throat> 1977 we're at a party in phoenix arizona and okay. a woman named susan is there and she lays eyes on a man named james and in that moment everything clicks in her soul it was she, love it was love and she says this is the one this is him that's what happened when our eyes met uh, i was like if you say austin i'll punch you but me yes 100 <laughs> percent except no because you were just sleeping in mr professor loman's class but that's you know okay. it was a long day it, <laughs> you were totally right about michael loman that was his right name. yeah he worked on what's Sesame up michael Street. loman uh okay so basically her feeling was she had been waiting for this man for the last three years of her life and she means that in a literal sense. I was so say three years. It's very specific. Not four? Okay. <laughs> no. So according to Oxygen, after taking mescaline on one occasion in 1974. Now, do you know what mescaline is? No. Because I'm like uh, not a big baby. I didn't really. Is totally that like a know. mushroom thing? It is a hallucinogen. Huh. It's the active ingredient in peyote. Oh. Uh-huh. And wow. uh, so she saw everything. She had. <laughs> she saw things. <clears throat> um, and according to Wikipedia, it's a naturally occurring psychedelic known for its hallucinogenic effects comparable to those of LSD. Hmm. So she had taken mescaline in 1974 and she had a vision that she would soon meet the man of her dreams. Whoa. Three years later, when she finally saw James at a party, she thought, this is the man I've been searching for. And according to James's daughter, Jen, who becomes like a character in the story, Jen said that when the pair met, quote, it was almost like two magnets just shooting across the room and joining. I think they had great sexual attraction. Girl, okay. It's like, that's their daughter talking? That's his daughter. That's how you know. That's Awkward. When your own kid can tell. Dad and stepmom. <laughs> just no way to deny it, Yikes. I guess. You know what? Kind of awkward, but you know what? I guess. I appreciate her awareness of the situation. For real. Why not be honest about it? Yeah. It's so, like, yo, they were horned up. Okay. They were ready I feel like to Jen go. somewhere is like, I didn't say that. 
<laughs> Sorry for the paraphrase again. <laughs> this is why we're not real journalists. <laughs> Um, so that party kicked off what would become significant chapters of both Susan's and Michael's lives. Now, remember, I just um, said Michael, but if you're listening very James. carefully, yeah, you're like, wait, that's not his name. Yeah, it's James, um, which I it took me a while to put that together. But there's a reason. OK, okay. so at the party, immediately after their eyes locked, Susan went up to James and told him about her vision that he was the one she had been waiting for. Can you imagine? Yeah. And so apparently instead of being like cool i gotta go refill my beer uh he was like wow i love that for us and was all over it good for her, good for her though like she did she just went for it right I'm saying, like if you are to approach someone and say like you're the man of my dreams don't you want him to say then let's fucking go yeah i mean what else it do worked you expect, out right like if he's like no i'm not then like you've got problems like, Ooh, i picked wrong yeah or i shouldn't have t- yeah because now the man of my dreams is, like, scared of me. Yeah. So. I do like to think if someone approached me and said something like that of, like, we're supposed to be best friends, I'd be like, I'll give it a whirl. Like, I think I would be like, I do too much true crime for this. I don't, <laughs> I don't think I, this is going to fly. I'd be fly. like, we'll text and maybe maybe see each other, like, for sure between like, a brick wall same. or something. I'd be like, cool, 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 cool. I'm really busy this weekend. Maybe some other time. Um, so he is like, hell yeah, I'm in it. I'm on it. And she says, here's the vision specifically. This is what I envisioned in my oh, mescaline God. high. Okay. okay. Here we go. Yeah. So she says, James, your name is really Michael. And you are named after the angel who fought the devil. And apparently the conversation literally went, no, my name is James. To which she responded, no, you are Michael, <laughs> an angel of God. Um, in that moment... <laughs> He immediately went, hmm, I was on board, and now I feel like I you am not on board. You think so, and you would hope so. But did he just, like, ride? He, he rolled was with like, it? okay, and he immediately, instantly changed his name to Michael. Like, not legally, but, like, in, started introducing himself she as She really Michael. did find her perfect match. Like, she, f- for what it's worth, they did match up pretty well. Yeah. And All he right. was, like, instead of, like, red flag central, it was, like, magical unicorn rainbow central of like this is my it sounds like that's exactly what they both wanted anyway, yeah yeah so, they sure. were bound to be uh magnetically horn dogged up or whatever you said a minute ago <laughs> um <laughs> and I, not jen i don't i stand by what i said <laughs> so oxygen described it uh, as follows it didn't take long for the new couple to descend into a life of sex and hallucinogenic drug taking but it wasn't all fun and games which to me sounds like keith morrison like but it wasn't all fun and games. Like he has like a <laughs> no, nah, that's not a good impression. Like, like a narrator before. But it the... wasn't all fun. like he has this pod. He has podcast now, and it's just like you can just hear Keith Morrison in your head, and it's so. I think of like um, what's his name, Zach Morrison or Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell. Oh, and he's like freeze frame. It wasn't all fun and games. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's a more fun way to do yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't all. I feel like Zach Keith Morris. The... That was his name, right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Eva, for the. <laughs> Some 80s knowledge there. He was like, check. Keith Morrison uh, always, to me, sounds like he's having too much fun with the horrible true crime story. Uh Like, but it wasn't all fun and games. Like, just get, just wait for me to tell you what happens. And it's like, okay. It's like he's on the edge of his seat with a really good story. With his own story. Yeah. Yeah. So, let me tell you a little bit about these two folks. So, Michael Bear Carson. That's his, like, new name, right? Because he was James, remember? Right. He was born James Clifford Carson on November 28th, 1950, Sagittarius, and grew up in Oklahoma. Um, according to a site called the Socians, I, I think that's how you say it, look, it's S-O-C-I-A-N-S, Socians? 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 I don't know. It's, it looks like social, but Socian. Yeah, socials Socians? with an N. Um, so I, uh, this website is really wild. So this is their little about me. It says at the Socians, Socians, we bring you lesser known and discussed contents in an interesting and broad range of comprehensive and enlightening articles on the subject range from bizarre crimes, occult history and mystery, untold stories, mini blogs, hashtag me too, and a forum to satisfy your thirst of knowledge and curiosity. We strive to maintain a balance of healthy skepticism and entertainment while never losing our sense of humor. I feel like we'd get along with them. That's a, it's a blast. I was on there like, are we the Socians? I love, I want to be one now hang on is that like a membership we can join i don't know i want to be invited if someone out there is a socian tell first tell us us how to say it yeah because that would be embarrassing in the interview if we don't know how to say it (laughs) all i want to do is be a socian and they're like well (laughs) that's that's not you're actually not allowed um that's test one and you failed (laughs) so according to their site james clifford carson was a non-traditionalist white collar class dropout he was learned and he took a unique enthusiasm for history religions and reasoning 
Uh, it was at University of Iowa where he was getting a degree in Chinese studies mm. that he met his first wife, Lynn. And when they graduated, they had a daughter named Jennifer. And that's Jen who Got it. later meets her stepmom, et cetera. Who describes him a little too well. A little too <laughs> yeah. on the nose, if yeah. you will. So the family moved to Arizona where he worked as a stay-at-home dad taking care of Jennifer. And Lynn worked as a teacher. And Jennifer remembers her dad as an adoring father. And, like, she considered herself daddy's little girl. But when she turned four or five... Lynn and Jennifer both noted problems with James. Um, he started dealing weed, and mm -hmm. around that time, he began becoming really violent. Um, according to an article on WBUR, which is uh, like the Boston Public Radio, okay. fun fact, oh. um, he began violently threatening anyone who upset him, including his own wife. Oh, shit. He got a gun, and that's when Lynn was like, I'm out of here. So when Jen was five in 1979, her mom, her parents divorced after a decade of marriage, and her mom was like, you're coming with me uh -huh. to the little one. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, Susan, who they have not, their stars have not aligned yet. Uh -huh. okay. She is um, named Susan Barnes originally. Now, I want to specify, it gets confusing, but Susan Barnes is S-U-S-A-N for now. Uh-huh. <laughs> on September for now, okay. For now, uh, on September fourteenth, nineteen forty-one, is when she was born. So she's a Virgo. She was living the classic American rural housewife life in the sixties. She had two teenage sons, um, but she kind of was feeling trapped. So she wanted more from her life. She got divorced, started doing drugs, uh, including LSD, mescaline, peyote, etc. And how is she getting her hands on peyote in the fifties or seventies? Seventies, okay. You know, a lot of things were traveling about. 70s, in the desert 70s. life. Like, I think, you know, if you're in the right crowds. Arizona. I think she's in Arizona, okay. yeah. Yeah, that makes um, more sense. In my mind, I was thinking <clears throat> Boston. No, the other guy, <clears throat> I, yeah, I did talk about the Boston uh, public NPR. radio, but um, no. So the the one guy's in Oklahoma. I'm not entirely sure. I think she was from Arizona. Is Whatever. She found whatever. peyote. She, was, she did it. If you want peyote, you can probably find it, is oh. what I'm guessing. Sounds um, like it. Yeah. So she starts doing drugs now. This gets pretty bad because she starts inviting her son, teenage son's friends and schoolmates over and like uh, sleeping with them, which is like, yucko. Yeah, um, that's messy. According to Oxygen, uh, it was thought that she had slept with 150 <gasps> young men. And by that, I mean like often boys. So, And these are all from her son's high school? Um, probably not all, but just like that's where she was Jesus. pulling them from. Okay. Um, so they were minors, right? Uh, a lot of them were miners. At okay, least. so we I should know. clarify. And it. not it was coal, rape. coal miners, not coal miners, not coal miners, child miners, child yeah. miners. And we should um, clarify it's rape. Though. I would think so. If okay. if they were yes, if they were her teenage son's friends, then presumably it was statutory rape. Yes, got it. So when she turned thirty five, while supposedly uh, totally sober, which okay, we'll see, but uh, allegedly sober, she had an epiphany that she was a mystic because she was having so many mind flights what in the world does that mean uh what is a mind flight big question mark okay but that is what led her to believe she is a mystic a prophet she's very special well i would sure like to know what the fuck a mind flight is so i can I see mean, if i'm I also a mystic honestly like you just wouldn't understand i apparently not i, I imagine that's like astral projecting that's all i can that's what it sounds like Right? A mind flight? You or, fly away from your own I mean, body? It sounds like drugs. <laughs> like, it sounds you like go drugs. on drugs and you have a mind flight is what it sounds like to me. So it sounds like when you're high, you are a... That's she what I'm she's thinking. A, okay. Like, literally high. I don't know, but... It's it's to each their own, obviously. I guess so. Uh, she was having mind flights and she was a mystic because of it. So, one of her visions told her she was going to meet a man called Michael. And by that, we mean James, but she decided he was named Michael because mm. he was the one. And she's like, well, I guess your name is now Michael because that fits my vision. Okay. So they did meet. This is just a fun, like, throwback to horoscopes. Horoscopes. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a Sagittarius and a Virgo, which apparently are not a good match. Loving that we're doing this. I know, right? That's a brilliant idea. Because, okay. like, like, this is one of those very much, like, partner crimes that, like, yeah. it's Have you just... ever done Bonnie and Clyde? Um, I did it for a live show once and okay. we did read the, we did read the horse. Fun. Okay. You're like fun. That must've been great. When we should, did it. I, bet, I bet I was impressed. <laughs> you were then excited too. then I so. think, but it's been a while. I'm sure I have the notes somewhere. Um, so the star sign compatibility as a Sagittarius and Virgo, this is according to astrology, zodiac signs.com. There's only a 32% romantic compatibility. Hmm. 
Uh, the relationship between a Virgo and a Sagittarius is not a usual happy ending emotional story. Uh-oh. Yeah. There are many challenges in their way, the biggest being their emotional lack of understanding and their possible lack of respect. Still, when they find a way to show emotions and share them in the same pace and in an understandable way, they could actually have a lot of fun together. Oh. Okay. Their communication is often exciting, and they both have a lot to say to each other, but their rationality may distract them from an actual search for love. Mm. If they discover how well they complement each other, they might be able to stay together for a long time. Now, compatibility-wise, they have a 1% compatibility when it comes to trust. What? Which is not good. Oh, my god! And when it comes to communication, they have a 60%. So, like, still a D, but way better than a 1% for so trust. So, wait, 1% on compatibility at all? No, no, for trust. For trust. Oh, 1% one, one that they will work out trusting That trust-wise, they are a good match. <clears throat> and 60% communication-wise. That sounds like some sounds bad... Like a- Bad combo. Stats. Yeah, it's not yeah. like a good sign. Hmm. Um, so if you're out there and you're like, wait, that's me and my partner. Like, I'm Uh-oh. sure it's different for you. <laughs> but also, like, if you happen to be like, <laughs> I feel I feel bad for that one, like, Virgo or Sagittarius who's in, like, having a fight right now with the person they're dating because they don't <laughs> trust each other. It's like, oh, no. Well, homie, but that uh, just 1%. Means it's in the stars. It's not your fault. Like, it's yeah, neither of your fault. It's just like it's the, the universe it's did it. The world's mind flight or it's something. A, it's the Mercury's on a mind flight. <laughs> Mercury's in mind flight, and it's not your fault, okay? So don't worry about it. 60% communication. Just talk it out. Yeah. You got this. You'll figure it out. Um, I mean, I'm dating a Cap- I mean, I'm married to a Capricorn. That's not supposed to work out either. So, like, hey, you know what? Sometimes it's, it can work. It's going to have to now. Look at that belly. It's, it's too late. It's too late to turn back. Um, so this was allegedly their fate, according to, um, according to Susan. And I guess also Michael slash James. But Jen, the daughter, reckons that because of her father's state at the time, quote, if he had fallen in love with a televangelist, he would have become one. If she had joined ISIS, he would have. Whoa. He was that much of a follower. He was drawn to extremists, people he found really exciting. Yeah. What is, what's their percentage rating on loyalty? A thousand That's a percent? great point. Blind that loyalty. Blind loyalty. That's a really good point. I mean, she, well, it, for since, her to even have the confidence of like, if I became like, a, like a cult member, he would absolutely have came with he me. He would become a terrorist. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that was the daughter saying it. Oh, oh, oh. Saying, like, if this woman, like, she was saying about her own dad. I like, like to think she still knows him pretty fucking yes, well. Yes, no, though, so. completely. And she was watching it from a third party perspective um, about her own dad, too. So she was like, he was screwed, basically, with wow. the next extremist he met. <clears throat> um, so I don't know if that's a Sagittarius thing. I don't know much about Sagittarius. So uh, I know Deirdre is a Sagittarius and she's like vastly independent though hmm i don't know i don't know i, I dated like, a sagittarius but i don't know i, I don't think he would have become a terrorist i've for never me. yeah i was gonna say i've never <laughs> met anyone that deirdre has been like i'd be a terrorist for them maybe you this know? is just a him problem a james <laughs> it, it feels like this Michael one problem. involves childhood matters <laughs> there's a lot more <laughs> happening behind the scenes maybe yeah. than just the stars okay So things progressed quickly, not surprisingly. They moved in together. Susan continued to have more visions as their relationship progressed. Um, So the next vision she had told her that they should change their last names to Bear Carson. So Bear, B-E-A-R. Just like add the word Bear, Grizzly Bear, to their middle names. So James slash Michael was now Michael Bear Carson, and she was Susan Bear. And... um, she also changed her name from Susan with an S to Susan with a Z. So that's where I was trying to say, like, oh. So instead of Susan, she's Susan. Instead of September, she's September. September, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Susan, Susan sounds the same to me, but so does September and September. So I don't know anymore. But <laughs> apparently she changed her name from Susan to Susan. Okay. Which is, like, that's the least wild thing she's done so far. Yeah, so <laughs> far, if that was, the, like, Allison's biggest request in our relationship, I'd be like, whatever. She's like, I'm going to take one L out of my name. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be wild. It's like, okay. I'm going to be Allison, actually. <laughs> I just am like, that's, okay. Uh, I guess that's the least wild. But I guess she had a whole vision about that. Hmm. Um, now, most strikingly, the next vision, um, Susan now urged Michael that they had a new calling, and this was that they were going to become witch killing Muslims. Holy shit! Wow, <laughs> that's a deep dive. It's that's a big bananas. change from just changing your Correct. last your middle name to Bear. So, like that part is like okay, you do you have a little crisis, change your name to an animal. That's fine. Also, this, like a bad look for Muslims. Yeah, these story. two white was... middle white suburban folks decide they're going to become quote witch killing Muslims, which is like. 
That's their phrase, to be clear. Wow. That's not, they n- did not actually become Muslims, to be clear. This is their phrasing. Right. So, yes, Muslims who kill witches was literally what they were trying Yikes. to do. Yikes. Yeah. Holy shit. Apologies <laughs> to witches and Muslims, by Apologies, the way. Apologies, big ones. Um, so as Oxygen later specified, unfortunately, Susan and Michael missed the part of Islam that prohibits the taking of mind-altering drugs and murder <laughs> so and while I we're at like it. They're kind of doing their own thing at this point. <laughs> while we're at it, right. Yeah. And created their own sick cult-like religion, dragging the name of Allah into it as justification. Gross. The couple claimed to be vegetarian Muslim warriors, that's a quote, uh, who held the belief that their higher power wanted them to kill people who took part in witchcraft, homosexuality, and abortion. Well, I'm gone. They believe I was gone a long time ago, uh, uh, but yeah, I guess <laughs> gone is in check I guess the fuck out welcome. of the story. Yeah. <laughs> they believed that they were doing this for the sake of the country's future and that they were initiators of a holy war against witches. Gross. If they were in this day and age, though, imagine the like ranks they would have climbed in QAnon by now. In QAnon, indeed. Yeah. Insane. I mean, it's it's story time and time. Tale as old as time. Let's mm-hmm. put it that way. As you say. Uh-huh. As one says. Sure, 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 sure. So now there's another cool site called Here's the Fucking Twist. Which is like <laughs> that. If that's not a podcast, it needs to be. And Are it you probably listening? Is. Here's the Fucking Twist. Can we be on your Please. show, actually? That'd be so fun. I love it. Um, in the most recent vision, Susan rattled off a list and Michael wrote it down. It was a list of witches, including President Ronald Reagan, Johnny Carson, and California Governor Jerry Brown, among others. Wow. And she also included a detailed plan on how they were going to kill Ronald Reagan. So that's good. Oof. That's great. Just ro- like, just have a paper trail for your presidential yeah, right. assassination. Why not good take call. a legal pad and write it down, just so you don't forget. So there's a Medium article by uh, Delanier Bartlett, and uh, this is a, a quote. This is I, I've already known about this for a while because it's one of my weird deep dive researches once. But uh, this kind of shared madness is called folie à deux. Do you no. know about that? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I do, but I'll explain why. Um, or more clinically, a shared psychotic disorder. So it's like a delusional disorder that's shared by two people. Oh. And it's often like people who share really close emotional ties. Um, and there's a passive partner and an active partner. Mm. Um, so Susan would have been the active partner in this case. And Michael is the passive one who just joins in so on the So is it like they're like en- enabling each other's like crazy thoughts yes it's sort of like they're both in the exact same like shared psychosis and so there's a follow-up boy album obviously called folia and it's obviously it's a great album but so that's obviously when i learned about it back in like high school but yes and in criminal minds it's like a common theme of like it's something called folia de shared madness of two. It's like a French term. Anyway, okay. so if you watch Criminal Minds, you probably have heard this term before. But that is what it's very rare because obviously um, it's a, it's tough to find two people who who are willing to read this. Yeah. yeah, who are like I'm a hundred and ten percent in on this thing about Muslims killing witches. Sure, you, that's what that's, happened. That's a rare find. <laughs> it's, a, it's a rare find. But I mean, she she was right about one thing, which is. That's the guy, and it was. <laughs> you know, like, the <laughs> one time the mescaline hit right. The one time. She found her man. The mescaline gave her an accurate vision. So they have this shared madness, this shared delusion, um, which is very dangerous, especially if it's, like, violent, because mm-hmm. they can both, like you said, like, back each other up and approve each other's right. terrible, terrible ideas. So the problem is... Well, there's a lot of problems, but one of the problems is that Michael's daughter, Jen, who was still a little girl, had to go shared custody and, <gasps> like, stay with them at the townhouse from oh, time to time. no. Yeah, and she, in, like, in a Huffington Post article, she, like, recalls, um, she does a lot of interviews, which is kind of cool to, like, talk about the experience and stuff. So we have a lot of, like, firsthand accounts from her. And she talks about Susan's living room being painted completely black. She said there were no furniture, no lamps. It was dark, and there were a hundred potted plants. It looked like the haunted forest in Snow White. It sounds like Eva's place on Halloween. <laughs> it's just, like, just succulents everywhere. <laughs> well, hopefully it stops there because she continued, when I would go there for visitations, they wouldn't feed me because they were passed out on the only piece of furniture in the apartment, which was a king-size waterbed. No, Eva feeds me. They so. were passed out naked. <laughs> okay, stop. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So it gets worse. So... There's a one waterbed, a hundred plants. Everything is painted black, um, and uh, this poor little girl comes over. Can to you stay. imagine the trauma? Trauma, that's, horrible. That's just like 
writing the I mean, next the therapy session. I mean, the fact that session. this Jen, as an adult, is like, it looked like the Snow White haunted forest. It's like so sad because as a little girl, you know that's what she was thinking about. Yeah. Like how scary that would have been. That's awful. So she also says um, she escaped the house once and tried to call the operator, and but all she could say was like she wanted her mommy, but like obviously they didn't know at the time like how to yeah, that's do awful. that. So like she was really... It was bad. That's so sad. And then, yeah, because they couldn't help her, so she just felt trapped and yeah. scared. And she, wa- and she, she clearly wanted out. to go home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. God. And so in that WBR, WBR article, uh, she remembers a particularly terrifying moment when her stepmother, Susan Carson, came into the room and started rubbing her back. She ended up scratching her and leaving five open wounds. Uh, she was saying things to me like, I will scratch the demon out of you. Oh, fuck off. What? The it, hell? Yeah. It was horrific. You remember when someone is threatening to kill you or tries and harms you in this way. I'm like, yeah, especially if you're a little kid. So it's also not just like emotional, mental trauma. Like she's now getting abused. Yes, correct. Holy shit. Okay. And the stepmother is like clearly off her rocker and is like, you're a demon now. You're a witch. Whatever, wow. You know? And it's like, Holy uh-oh. crap. Is Jen still alive? Yes. She, yes. Poor she's doing Jen. all these interviews. Um, so that was the final straw. Thank God for Jen's mother, Lynn, who was like, who they like went on the run. Cause she was like, I don't want her involved sure. in this man's life. Duh. Took them four. She's, they were on the run for like four years, which sucks that like, that's what you have to do to get out of the situation. Yeah. You have to go into hiding basically to I like hope. escape this abusive person. But you I know, hope the world treated them kindly. I do that. too. Holy crap. So Lynn packed up the car in the middle of the night, took her daughter. They left Phoenix and they spent the next four years moving across the country. They finally settled in Orange County, California. And Lynn, all she told her daughter was like, your father's sick, so we can't be near him. That's so sad, Which is really sad. Especially as a little kid when you don't understand mental illness. Yeah, completely. just be like, you know. I mean, yeah, like, dad's sick. There's the, nothing you can do about it. Which is, like, it. true, you know? And the last thing she remembers is being told she has a demon inside her. Yeah. Wow. So, thankfully, wow. at least they got out of there before much more happened. Um, after a year of being together, Susan and Michael sold their townhouse and traveled to Europe so that they could preach their beliefs, quote-unquote beliefs, to the people of Europe. Okay. Um, as part of their travels, they landed in Stonehenge and had a moonlit wedding whatever that means it wasn't legally binding it's not like anybody actually well it sounds like they're oh they're they're witch killers not witches no they're witch killers witch killing muslims god damn it okay because i was gonna say like maybe it's like a a moon a nighttime ceremony under the moon or something but maybe they called it a muslim ceremony but like it wasn't uh... obviously so they traveled around europe for a year but then ran out of money which obviously like i don't think that they were doing anything productive with their time. So they decided to go. Right. To Did they have jobs? This I whole don't time? know. Honestly, God. it doesn't sound like it. Okay. Um, they decided to go to San Francisco where they moved in with a woman named Karen Barnes, which oh, poor Karen. Uh, well, poor Karen. Uh, yeah. Poor Karen. Okay. Poor Karen. Yeah. Poor Karen. Indeed. Um, you're not wrong. So she, uh, was an aspiring actor and her last name is Barnes, but she's not related to Susan Barnes. Um, which is what her coincidences in this story. I know. So Karen Barnes was a 23-year-old aspiring actor from Georgia, enjoying kind of the hippie scene of San Francisco. And a while into rooming with Karen, Michael and Susan started to really like Karen and want her to be part of their relationship on a more sexual level. With her consent? Well, I'm just saying they wanted her to be in the fold in a sexual way. I don't want that for her. I don't either. So they approached Karen with their proposition, and she was like, I'm not interested but Susan was like, oh, I know why she declined. Do you have a guess? Because she's a witch? Correct. Motherfucker. Yeah. So she's like, I know why she doesn't want to be in a relationship with us because she's a witch. And so. she and we she would be falling in love with two witch killers, obviously. Obviously. That would be terrible. It's like Romeo and Juliet. Can you imagine? Do um, they kill her? Correct. Yes. So mm-hmm. as witch killing vegetarian Muslim warriors, they were like, wow, we got to figure this out. They had a vision. It came during a rainstorm. And uh, they decided, wow, Karen is a witch who is trying to steal our yogic powers. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, Susan said she believed Karen was taking away her health, power, and beauty. Um, so, <laughs> I think you're just aging and problematic, <laughs> my friend. I think you just have bigger problems. I think you're problems, just withering away. And you're refusing to look in the mirror. All right. It's someone else's beauty that's the problem. Okay. Uh, so they were like, we know what to do. Um, Apparently, during the rainstorm, every time Susan thought about killing Karen, the thunder would clap. So she's like, that's the universe telling me, or Allah telling me this is a sign. So on March 6, 1981, Susan ordered Michael to kill Karen when she got home from work. 
That evening, Michael stalked the 23-year-old to the kitchen where he beat her in the head with a cast iron <gasps> frying pan and then stabbed her 13 times. Holy shit. In the face and neck. Uh, they then wrapped her body in a blanket, put her head on a pillow, and did a series of bizarre childlike drawings all over the walls before leaving. And that was an oxygen quote. Um, oh. Now, there's no photos of these drawings or, like, much description, but we do know that she had written, Susan had written her name next to all the drawings. So, Ugh, like, at the very least, God. we know it was very, like, there was no doubt that she had done this. Thanks for giving yourself credit? For signing like, your work. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. And also, like, interesting that I wonder if the 13 stabs was on purpose. <gasps> oh, I didn't think if about that. If she's a that. witch, right? Fuck, 100%. That would have been a really Maybe. weird coincidence. Otherwise, I feel like that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it makes no sense, but it makes zero. Yeah, your theory we're trying makes to sense. make sense out of something right, that is right. just senseless. So, um, the following day, police found Karen's body in the apartment. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, there's no pictures of these drawings or any description, but they did say Susan. Um, a close friend of Karen's who had heard the news went to the crime scene and told police, like, hey, she was living with these two weird people named Michael and Susan. See something, say something. See something, say something. And she thought they were pretty odd and they had disappeared. So, hello, suspects. Um, and when the police spoke to Karen's mom, the thank God Karen's mom, like, knew their full names, mm. Michael and Susan Bear Carson. However, since those weren't their real names and they were never legally changed, oh. they were not in the database anywhere. Kind of, I mean, for crazy killers, brilliant move. But yeah. like, yeah, that it's sucks. a bummer. That real bummer. Yeah. So, <laughs> unfortunately, they were not able to find them on any databases, and they spent a year trying to locate these roommates in California. And again, this is like the early '80s. There's not much tracking. You can't track necessarily people's like GPS or credit cards. You know that kind of thing. So it was very. They just couldn't find them. Um, so the c case went cold. Meanwhile, Michael and Susan had hitchhiked to Oregon and they believe it was Allah who led them to a mountain hideout where they stayed for refuge, but they got bored <laughs> pretty quickly Okay, and decided in spring of 90, 1982 that they wanted to move back to California. So they moved to a place called Alder point and decided to start working on a marijuana farm. This is where I'm like, man, I wish they had just moved to a marijuana farm, lived out the rest of their stupid lives there and left people alone. But, but okay. no, they just can't it drop just got the fucking fake Muslim thing. Um, okay. So they had an argument with, with a coworker. He was 26 years old. His name was Clark Stevens, and he was friends with the owner of the farm, where they, the marijuana farm. And because he was loud and drank a lot, uh, the Bear Carsons, as they were known, decided, oh, he's, this is blasphemous. He's, like, insulting our god, Allah. Okay. So, which I'm like, you're doing LSD every day. Right, okay. But okay, I guess you also, he's um, I'm pretty beer. sure... Definitely right. fucking murdered right. somebody. Let alone stab somebody. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They are the wrong ones. <sighs> so he says, uh, they are like, well, he's uh, blaspheming our God. So <clears throat> according to us, a.k.a. the Socians, the Socians. That's us. <laughs> what, officially, <laughs> whether or not they want us. <laughs> Too late. I've made the decision. Uh, <laughs> what had happened was that for one reason or another, Susan tried to block Clark from entering the farm one day. So Clark cussed her out. So Susan declared Clark a witch, and Michael was tasked as his executioner. Oh, God. He shot Clark in the face. Whoa. They got rid of the body by burying it in the woods under chicken fertilizer after burning it. He was then reported missing two weeks later to the Humboldt County Sheriff, who was successful in finding the remains. And James Carson would later explain uh, that James, a.k.a. Michael, would later explain that Clark Stevens was a demon who had abused his wife, and that's why they uh, killed him. So. Wow. So. And for what it's worth, the end of the story later, he, he basically explains that everybody they killed was abusing his wife. And it's like, I don't think that's true. I guarantee you it's you're like wrong. not. Yeah, it's I just like a weird lie that he invented to okay. make it sound better, but it like doesn't. Okay. Um, so similar to the whole Karen thing, Susan and Michael fled north again to go back into the woods and hide, which they did. And while they were busy living in the wild and they would only go to town for food, Police had discovered some of the uh, couple's belongings. Most importantly, they had left behind a manifesto in which they described how they were going to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. Again, yeah, paper trail. Leave <laughs> Just it, Just left please. it there. And so, they really love signing their names on so shit. So like, stupid. Yeah, even they wrote their name all over the, the on other the walls. Death too. Yeah. Jeez. So now they're writing this fucking manual of how to kill the president, and so of course, the the government is like, uh oh, this isn't good. These these 
people who have murdered multiple people are now writing like a pamphlet on how to kill a president. Um, and so it was because of this, this is the first time Jennifer and Lynn, like the, the daughter and ex-wife, uh, ever heard about these murders because the Secret Service showed up at their door and they're like, we have this documentation that like your ex-husband wants to murder the president. And Lynn oh, was like, fuck. wait, what? And so they hadn't even heard about any of the murders until the Secret Service showed up and was like, yeah, they've murdered a couple people and they want to kill the president. And they were like, thank oh. God we ran away four years ago. I yeah, guess. truly. Because we didn't want to be part of this. So the case went somewhat cold as they were trying to track them down. But unfortunately, this time they... This is pretty weird. So uh, according to Here's the Fucking Twist, uh, Michael ended up being randomly arrested for hitchhiking in Los Angeles uh, in November of 1982. But due to police error, he was quickly released and he disappeared before they realized who he was. So like the police brought him into arrest. They arrested him, but then they like, let just, him like, go. Dashed. He like made up. And they were story. like, wait, that was the guy who's <laughs> we're looking for. And he was gone. So. It sucks. What was the what was the way that he got himself out of there? Do they accidentally know? released him due to police error. So oh, like, accidentally released him. They okay. released him and then he was gone and they were like, "Oh shit, that was the guy we were looking for." And then he just it was and a dash to the races in the wind. Yeah, and unfortunately, there's another victim. So it's like that really could have been. I would have been. Sucked. I would lose sleep as the cop who just let that person yeah, go. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that they probably did. <clears throat> So by January of 1983, Michael and Susan caught a ride into town with a 30-year-old man named John Charles Hellier and his pickup truck. Susan was sitting between Michael slash James and John. And while driving, uh, John touched Susan's leg, allegedly, which intimidated her. And she suddenly had a clarity from Allah that he was a witch. So, wow. so. Just ev- any, <laughs> any slight inconvenience yeah. that a bo- that disturbs her for less than a millisecond. And I also feel like being a witch is such a cliche now. Like, really, you couldn't think of anything better than, like, the like, classic, like, oh, you look funny, you're a witch. Oh, yeah. you made me, you stole my tomatoes, you're a witch. Like, I feel like it's just such a cliche. It's like, okay, it's been done, by the it's way. It's been like, done. 1692, am I It's right? been done like, really thoroughly. We like, don't need to do it like, over. At least be original. Jesus. I guess they are with their Muslim thing. I guess. I guess they tried to put Q a spin on it. At least QAnon's lizard people, but then again, I guess that's not really original either. <laughs> yeah, none of it seems to be none very creative good. or original. So, um. It just, it's, like, clear, it's, like. They're just coming up with a reason because they don't fucking like it. Because they're just like decided. This yeah. is this is this is the the you don't justification to live. exactly. Yeah. So allegedly he touched her leg. She was like, "Wow, this man is a witch." So uh, they Michael pulled a gun on John, but John fought back, stopped the car. They were wrestling outside over the gun, and Susan stabbed John. And in this moment, Michael grabbed the gun from John and shot him in front of. A ton of drivers on the road. Like, so many didn't witnesses. Even, yeah, like everybody saw this happen. So, a UPS driver saw the shooting. So, he called the police, ran over to John to help. And this, this is really sad. John's last words were, Help me, brother. Oh. And John's brother, Danny, worked for UPS and <gasps> thinks that it was because oh. this guy was in a UPS uniform and who tried to help him. And his last words were, that's Help me, brother. Fuck. So, his brother, so Danny, sad. thinks like that's. Which he says haunts him. Obviously. Oh, can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. and he just uh, yeah. So oh, it gives me goose like him. he was the last person you thought of. Yes, yeah. Or you were the last person you thought of. Exactly. So um, the police ran over to River Road. Um, I guess one, the I guess the cop who was called had been at a fruit stand, which is very California. A very so, California. Oh my gosh, I'm regularly called at a fruit I know. stand. The jicama can wait. <laughs> oh god, I love a good jicama. There's one guy right next to my favorite donut place that well, has a great jicama. Great his combo. Fruit cart. Great California combo. Some donuts and some jicama. Yep. Um, so uh, the police show up from the fruit cart and uh, they do a car chase they follow michael and susan in john's car by the way because they were hitching a ride so they had taken his car um the police were able to catch up with michael and susan and they spun the truck out of control into a ditch they were arrested brought into the station and while being questioned michael and susan had no interest in speaking about their motive for murdering john they only wanted to talk about their religion quote unquote and about witches and police had found a letter Michael had written, which said that no one cared that he and Susan had killed the biggest witch in San Francisco. Um, and when the police were like, okay, they're admitting to killing the biggest witch in San Francisco, they were like, oh, that was Karen Barnes. Because they put together like all the weird drawings and the same names, and they went on the run. And uh, so... Yeah. They were basically like, aha. So he has a letter that says, why does, basically bitching that nobody cared 
that he killed the biggest witch in San Francisco, which is like cool which, like, complaint. Cool complaint, but also I do appreciate that he didn't get the notoriety he was hoping for. Yes, that too. That's true. That's true. But I mean, like, I still wish I wish it didn't happen. Obviously, yeah. But like, I do appreciate when like you don't get what you want out of right. Something it's that better horrific. than being glorified, I guess. Yeah. So they obviously connected the dots and were like, "Aha! These are the same people who killed Karen Barnes." Thankfully, we figured this out. However, when they tried to get them to confess on on record. Uh, They insisted they would only confess if they put them on a press conference Mm. because they wanted to talk to the masses, the public. So according to Oxygen, on March 10th, a press conference was held where the Carsons ranted about everything from George Orwell's 1984, President Reagan being the devil, and why witches need to be killed. Uh, Michael said Susan had the power to identify witches via visions she got from Allah, and that's how they knew they had to kill Karen. (laughs) <laughs> Can you imagine them being like, this was a mistake, giving them a press conference? It's like, why did we give them a mic? <laughs> Someone's shit. like slowly taking the microphone yeah. and it's just kind of like... They're just turning the volume down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going. Uh, we're all listening. <clears throat> so they also admitted to killing the marijuana farm guy, Clark. And after six hours of ranting, they... Six hours. I can't, Not to gloss over that. Like, six how hours. How come after six minutes they weren't like, let's shut this down? This That's what much. I wonder. I guess because they were they were uh, confessing to multiple crimes throughout that. So they so, were kind of like, we have to keep them going. So I at guess, least they'll keep talking. I guess. And since it's a press conference, I don't know. Maybe they didn't like put it on TV. I don't. I don't know how it works. I really don't. Um, but so they they were charged after this six hour rant with multiple crimes, including three counts of first degree murder. Their trial began in May of 1984, and despite having confessed to everything in the press conference, they both pleaded not guilty. They were like, we didn't do that. (laughs) It's like, wait a second. (laughs) Wait, what? They They pleaded not not guilty. guilty Yeah, yeah. So what did they what? I know you're going to get to it later, but like, did they was their defense like that? They were like high on mescaline or something. No, their defense is that they didn't do it. (laughs) I'll get to it. But they were high on mescaline and uh, and that's why they had been rambling. No, no. They just said, wait, no, we didn't do it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. So um, (laughs) I want to say I'll explain, but like I won't explain. (laughs) I'll just say that again in like a minute. I'll just repeat it. I'll just repeat it. Um, So they pleaded not guilty. According to the Petaluma Argus Courier report, Michael Carson said they only confessed to the three deaths at the conference, at the press conference, because we don't believe in lying, which implies to me that Okay, so you weren't lying. Right. Right? Like, yeah. I don't know. But right, right. they said they wouldn't tell if they killed anyone else. They said, but you're not going to get anything else out of I feel like they're breaking a lot of, of rules that, like, most... <laughs> that's, like, a basic tenet in any religion of, like, don't lie. Don't fucking murder. Don't... I mean... <laughs> okay. Sorry. Just keep oh going. Oh, my God. Um... That's because you don't know about their religion. This is I'm their not religion. one of them, clearly. No. I mean, I am a homosexual. Might as well be a witch. Just throw it on <laughs> Just there. Just throw it in there. Um, so they said, we don't believe in lying, but we will not say if we killed anyone else. Don't try us. I feel like being secretive about something yep. like that is also not good. Saying, don't ask me. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh. So uh, they said, we are not fools. We know exactly what we are doing. We are doing it for good reason. Okay. Sure, okay. Sure, 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 sure. That's what they all say. After three days of this trial, which Jen describes as a zoo, the daughter, Michael and Susan were both found guilty and given life sentences. Uh, Michael is incarcerated at Mule Creek State Prison. Susan's at Central California Women's Facility. Um, And the most recent update I could find is that in 2020, Michael was denied parole. Um, According to a CBS News report, he canceled his original parole hearing in 2015 because he didn't want to renounce his religious beliefs. This is where I was surprised because I was like, after all the drugs and decades later, you'd think that they would have at least had like you'd think at least some clarity. I mean, I wonder if they like had the ability to write each other letters or something, and he was still holding on because like you think if he's like completely separated and removed from her after all those years, he would have had shared psychosis. Yeah, he would have had some sort of awakening. That's a good point, and it makes me wonder like maybe if it's just a desperation of like not admitting to yourself that you literally just killed people for no reason. Or maybe it's one of those things where you think about it for so long, like you're, you've convinced yourself that you were and right. And you just can't back out of it. I don't know. Yeah. Cause he said he refused to, uh, he canceled his parole hearing because he refused to renounce his religious beliefs. And he said, no one is going to parole me because I will not and have not renounced my beliefs. He wrote on a form to cancel the hearing in 2015. Susan was denied parole for 15 years and her next hearing is set for December, 2030. So I don't know. Yeah, so I don't know where she stands. I do know that he apparently is still claiming that he uh, <laughs> he believes what he did and was so right. That's, that's in like nine years. He's, yeah. She's got another chance. Uh-huh. 
Wow. And he was denied in 2020. So he had another hearing last year and was denied parole. So, so there's a chance she'll probably, she'll probably get denied in 2020. I have a feeling it'll probably be denied unless she's like, wow, you're right. I was so crazy. I shouldn't have done that. You know that. what? I was going to say what would be a real twist is, is if she convinced him into this kind of world or like like enabled him into thinking uh-huh. like this. But he ref- he refuses to like He's Give the one who up. doesn't let it go. But she's she not. Does. But she does. I feel yeah. like that is a very like cl- like that could be like a movie plot. Then like, I imagine he would really fucking snap by like twenty thirty. Then he's yeah. gonna lose his mind. Yes, yeah. I think that would really break his brain. Um, I feel like that's a very <laughs> Criminal Minds plot. I, I think, think that, so too. That could be sure. an episode of Criminal Minds. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about real quick is from that WBUR article. It was written by Yasmin Amer, and uh, she wrote a piece with Jen. So it was like Jen's first hand, the daughter's first hand account it, from it. childhood all the way to like the trial and today. Um, and she told she's told a lot of news stations like about her relationship with her dad and how things have been from her perspective. Yeah, have they gotten better? Does she talk no, about it? No, I don't think they have a relationship. I don't blame her if they I don't mean, talk at all. She. she yeah, I don't totally know. Um, it doesn't seem like all of her viewpoints seem very much like from the perspective of like she and her mom, it, like learning about this and having to like witness the trial. And I can't even imagine. Like, I mean, just just that one time of like being in that dark room and like getting scratched on her back should have been that's like alone. enough yeah, terror. That enough. Let alone having to spend the next four years on fucking edge all the time. Yeah, traveling around the country hiding. Yeah, I imagine as a child feeling some sort of guilt of like my mom is doing this Completely. for me and her whole life is uprooted. Probably some fear, and then and then learning like my dad is sick, but not knowing what that means and not knowing how to fix it or why is my dad sick and what's going on with that and not even knowing. And then on top of that, like your dad is a killer yeah and now you have to like unpack that for yourself yeah. and now he's in jail and he's also still after all these years not renouncing and he refuses anything. to change his like i can't imagine what she's going through yeah. that, that woman deserves a medal yeah agreed and so she talks a lot about that experience and she um this is just a really like sweet anecdote that i feel like is a good like button to this story speaking of uh loman's class he taught us what a button is at the end of mm-hmm. a, an episode um so she talked about the time of her parents' divorce and the murders and a teacher she had named Mrs. Case. So this is um, from Yasmin's article. Uh, so just to not try and butcher this, I'm just going to read the section from the article. Sure. By third grade, Jen was preparing herself for another difficult academic year. She put her hair in front of her eyes to avoid interacting with the new teacher. Yeah. I know. It was then that the teacher, Mrs. Sylvia Case, did something Jen didn't expect. Quote, I just remember her saying, Jenny, I heard you were such a great reader. Why don't you help me hold the book? Aww. It makes me want to cry. That's all it makes me want to cry. Um, that was the beginning of something new. Jen learned to love books, and over the years, she caught up academically. Mrs. Case once brought her hair barrettes as a prize for good grades. On Mrs. A... Case. I know. We don't deserve teachers. I know. Especially Mrs. Case. Uh, for good grades on a spelling test to help her keep her hair out of her eyes. She also helped Jen get into the Girl Scouts and apply for reduced lunch when she suspected money was tight at home, which it was. But there's one thing Jen remembers the most. A lot of teachers would say, good job. She would say, your cursive M's look like art. She oh, would, I know, Mrs. K. No, it makes me cry. Oh my gosh. She would give sincere and specific compliments, and I think it's one of the kindest things you can do because you're saying to another human, I see you and I see the goodness in you. Aww. Jen never told Mrs. Case or any adult for that matter about any of this. She just remembers going into her class and asking for a hug, which also shows that, like, this Mrs. Case woman was so intuitive and, like, Mrs. Case knew what the fuck was going on. She was like, I don't know what's going on, but I know something is going on. And, like, you're going through something. Also, like, I love when kids feel safe to give their teachers hugs. Completely. so sweet. Completely. Um, So she said, uh, she remembers asking for a hug. When I found out that my father was a monster who killed a bunch of people and my brain started saying, you're worthless, you're a bad girl, I kept going to Mm. Mrs. Case. She said I was a good girl and she built a resilience in me that I believe saved my life. Jen went on to live a full life, which included going to college, getting a master's degree in counseling, and now working in suicide prevention. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Wow, (laughs) wow, wow. For a long time, she's tried to contact Mrs. Case to thank her, but was never successful. When we heard Jen's story, we also wondered what happened to Mrs. Case. Right. With some research and luck, we found her. (gasps) It turns out the two women only live around 50 miles away from each other, so we arranged for them to meet. And you can see the reunion video on WBUR's website. Oh. And at one point, Jen says to Mrs. Case, you weren't just doing your job. You did it with kindness. (laughs) 
<laughs> so that's the story. Wow, that almost got me. <laughs> that was really, that was emotional. Oh, my God. <clears throat> so that's the story of Michael and Susan Bear Carson trying to fuck up everybody's life, but some good still remains. Um, Excuse me, that's the story of Mrs. Case and Jen, like, exactly. curveballing the entire uh, exactly. storyline. That exactly. was th- well done to the two of them. A button. A button on the end. A nice little button on yeah. the end. And I'm glad they found each other. That's so sweet. I think that's and really, And also shout really out great. to whatever article that was for making the time to, like, go out there and find someone Yasmin. and reunite them. Yasmin Amer at WBUR. Wow. Well done. Shout out. At least that ended nicer. I know. Despite I know. the circumstances. Um, let me see. The the baby's the size of a baby, hopefully, because oh, right. it's supposed to be here by now. I forgot that's what we're... Like oh, a baby. hydro jug. <laughs> the baby's actually the size of a house. So. Of, of an actual house, yeah. Um, <sighs> let me see what it says on here. I think the la- I think we already read the last one, which was... Uh, it's, it's been a while. I think the baby is the size. I mean, I think it's literally the pizza from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so... Like it's a big baby. Ow. That's a big baby. I think we're at Kermit the Frog. Um, no, we're past Kermit the Frog. We're at Cabbage Patch Kids doll. I don't know. I think we're at the size of a car. Just get it out, I guess is what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so upset. Right bef- before the midwife a- appointment, I was like, that baby's coming out tonight. I and was I like hoping tell. my blood pressure was through the roof. And I was like, wanted let's... you to be in almost like danger zone for your blood. Uh, honestly, pressure. and was like, let's piss her off. And Eva was like, maybe let's not do that. <laughs> I want the baby here so bad. I know, but me too. Uh, and then you came back from your midwife appointment, and she was like, we can try, but like it could still be up to three weeks. And it's like, oh, so that sounds miserable. I'm gonna to drink me. some tea and eat some spicy food. Yeah, Eva and I we're gonna we're gonna come up with some sort of spicy food. I got a yoga situation. ball to sit on. I mean, we'll try. We're gonna we're gonna get this baby out. We'll see what we can with, do with enough with enough manifestation. We will get it done. <laughs> we'll manifest it. But I mean, by the time that this episode does come out, there will be a baby, so we will have ha- that's we true. Will have succeeded. It will have worked eventually. It's crazy that when it comes out. People are hearing this happen right now. Yeah. Well, there's a whole other part to the story we don't even know about yet. I know. That's, that's super fun. <gasps> How scary is that? That's I think wild. about things like that all the time. I do time. too. But the thing is, this comes out on the, I think the 10th. So like it could, listen. I don't, no, I, it will. No. Okay. 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 Because <laughs> I could still be pregnant that week. You're is not when I would telling the truth. You're not telling oh, the truth. I really hope not. I hope I'm lying. Check Instagram. It might be there. I don't know. I, I it's gotta be because if it's you if guys it, know before I do in this episode so like they probably Instagram. hear us they're like the baby has already cried in a bunch of episodes like we already know what's going <laughs> or they're like uh stop stop, stop. <laughs> I don't know they could just be telling us it's to shut up it's a little baby also I'm very excited to feel it move again later because that freak I touched its little foot earlier yeah you we, were like is that its foot and I was like yeah we bumped actually. foot so I put my foot up on Christine's belly and we yeah, I knew that other. was gonna happen and I fun. didn't move away in time I didn't do it hard I know oh, you did baby so sweet so I'll eat something I'll eat some ice cream and then you can we'll both eat some ice cream me and the baby <laughs> yeah and that's why we drink